Okay, good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. I'd like to remind everyone present to please turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. We've received apologies from Malcolm Chisholm this morning. Our first item of business this morning is to decide whether to take item 5 in private. Are members agreed? Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business this morning is to take evidence from Professor David Bell and David Iser, both of the University of Stirling's Division of Economics, on their recently published paper, Scotland's Fiscal Future in the UK. I would like to welcome both to the meeting. The paper was circulated to members in advance of today's meeting, so we'll go straight to questions from the committee. Uh, and as usual, I will obviously uh, start the questioning process. However, before we start, I'd point out that we have a very full agenda today, and I'd like to be extremely pressed for time. I should therefore have to restrict each member's questioning on this item to no more than 10 minutes, and of course I'll have a, uh, I, I, will, I myself will try to adhere to those time scales. Um, and so no meandering, John, when it comes to your turn. Okay, uh, so... Uh, Professor Bell, or indeed David, if whichever one of you prefers to answer questions, it's completely up to yourself, and of course both of you can comment if you so wish. Uh, in terms of looking at options for further uh, fiscal devolution, you say in the third paragraph of page three, uh, the Labour Party's proposals are somewhat more modest, amounted to an extension to the Scotland Act so that a devolved part of income tax increases from 10p each rate to 15p. The proposals also allow Scottish Government to vary the progress progressivity of income tax, albeit in a fairly restricted way. Um, of course, not to reduce that progressivity. I'm just wondering, um, what's your view on how, whether that would advantage or disadvantage uh, Scotland? So, um, the proposal to uh, increase the... Um take from 10 pence to 15 pence really um, amounts to a an extension basically of the kind of revenue share it doesn't give control over progressivity and uh, it doesn't really give you control over tax bans and then the question is what advantage might you seek to gain out of having control of tax bans and progressivity. And the question there, uh, I mean, clearly there, there, one question would be, can you increase revenue, total revenue, by, say, having higher bans? And possibly, um, well, what that depends on is how taxpayers react to changes in the tax rate. And that's something that we don't really know all that much about. We know a bit about it, but we don't know a huge amount about it. It also depends on how the rest of the UK reacts. Now, one of the things I think that we do bring out is, you know, there is a huge size difference uh, between uh, uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK. And the rest of the UK might not be too worried if Scotland, uh, say, cut an income tax rate relative to, um, relative to the rate that pertains in the rest of the UK. That might be true. It depends how mobile people are between Scotland and the rest of the UK and whether people come in and out of the labour market because of changes in income tax rates. So um, having the slab increases the revenue and it changes your incentives in the following way. It makes um, the kind of block grant adjustment will have to be larger. And so there therefore is more pressure on the Scottish Government to grow the economy f as fast or faster than the rest of the UK in order to keep its um, total public spending <coughs> Uh, in line what it, with what it would have been had the Barnett formula continued. Once you start playing around with the bans and the rates, then you're going to induce things to happen in response to these changes. And they may be good, they may be bad, but you are constrained to some extent by you know, what your larger neighbour is doing because uh, at some point people will react. 
figure in evidence this committee and his paper suggested that a specific proposal could cost Scotland 2% of its GDP and uh, 75,000 jobs. Is that something you think is exaggerated, accurate? What do you feel having a different rate, a higher rate here, which can't be reduced relative to the rest of the UK? Having a higher rate here, um, there's certainly one issue with that, and that is because we have a highly unequal distribution of income in Scotland. A large proportion of our uh, income tax is paid by a relatively few people, those on the higher and particularly the, the additional rate of, uh, of income tax. Uh, so there is the potential to uh, cause movement. <coughs> sorry, cause movement between Scotland and the rest of the UK. If you if you go massively up compared with the rest of the UK um, in terms of let's say the additional rate, uh, I would be surprised if if, um, if you're talking about as much as two percent of GDP. It all it obviously depends on how much you change the rates. And th there's obviously a penal rate at which point, you know, it, uh, it, um, increases in taxes become self-defeating. Increasing the tax rate becomes self-defeating. Okay, let's move on to something else. It, so, oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't realise, David, you wanted to comment also. I mean, um, in, in some uh, previous work that we did on this, we looked at the question of um, how much additional revenue would come to the Scottish Government if 1p was placed on each rate of income tax. Um, now, assuming there's no behavioural response, um, we, the research suggested that uh, there would be an extra £460 million, uh, coming to the uh, Scottish Government. When you take into account these likely behavioural responses that David's been talking about, so the possibility that some people decide to relocate either as individuals or to relocate some of their income, um, then that additional revenue might be uh, more like around 370 million. So a difference of around 100 million when you take into account these behavioural effects. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure how that uh, aligns with your, 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 the previous uh, figures that you, you quoted. But um, I mean, the other point, just in terms of progressivity, I think the Labour proposals were that uh, the income tax devolved to Scotland should be, the progressivity of that should be able to be increased but not necessarily decreased. Um, and I'm not sure quite why you would want to restrict yourself to that kind of um, being able to move the progressivity in one direction but not another. Now, on the issue of VAT, uh, Devo Moore recommends that half of the VAT revenues raised in Scotland should be assigned to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, in, in such a situation, would Scotland, do you think, have any say in setting the rate? I think um, the evidence that we have at the moment is that uh, EU law would preclude any differences in rates of VAT within uh, parts of the same territory, so it doesn't seem likely uh, that under that basis uh, the rate of VAT would be something that would be able to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament to be different in Scotland relative to the rest of the UK. Yeah. I'm aware of that. It's the issue is the issue. What they're saying is that because of that, there's a possibility that maybe half of VAT could be assigned to Scotland. Certainly, you know, I mean, although it wouldn't be there wouldn't be a, a different rate from the from the UK. But would we have a role in helping to set that rate? Um, I guess that is a question about uh, intergovernmental relations and uh, and how those yeah. play um, out. <clears throat> um, so this is what we're talking about here is a tax sharing arrangement. M most of the um, proposals that are being put forward are not for tax sharing, but tax sharing is pretty common, say in countries like Germany. And effectively that means somehow coming to an agreement about um, the tax rate and then divvying it up according to some formula. What that means is that Scotland wouldn't share the risk, or sorry, it wouldn't have a different risk 
from the rest of the UK. All of the VAT would be pulled together from, for the whole of the UK and Scotland would get 9%, whatever percent of that. So if the rest of the UK is booming, uh, and you know they're all buying uh, high high value uh, items. A lot of VAT revenue south of the border. Scotland would still get a share of that, even if its economy wasn't or people weren't spending so much in Scotland uh, compared with the, the uh, rest of the UK. So t um, f sharing of taxes is not something that seems to be very much on the table here. Um, it's quite common in other countries, and it can, can give a misleading impression of how much power the different uh, sub-central governments, or for example, in the German case, the lender, uh, have. Um, and you've, you've got exactly the right uh, uh, point there, because they don't have a huge say in setting the conditions for the tax. On to corporation tax, you've said that it's been proposed for devolution by Devo Plus on the basis that economic and business development are devolved policy areas, although most proposals recognise the risks inherent in devolving corporation tax, namely the fact that the high mobility of the tax base may trigger tax competition. But surely there's already corporation tax competition uh, right across the world. You know, I mean, it almost looks as if you're referring to this only within the British Isles, as if somehow the rest of the world is you know, not significant to this whole discussion. That's what I read into but that. There certainly is corporation tax competition. Um, I, I was looking at some OECD figures on corporation tax rates, and it's absolutely clear uh, that they're converging downwards. The standout exception is the United States, which still has a, a, a corporation tax above 30, well above 30 percent, and that's been the cause of some recent disputes that have been uh, uh, emerging. Things like the Pfizer takeover uh, related to specifically that issue. So it, it does seem to me that uh, corporation tax rates are converging downwards, but I think the rates are only a part of the story because the allowances. Uh, and the uh, uh, you know the the whole nature of the way the tax is applied can vary even if you have the same headline corporation tax rate uh, and and that in itself uh, or these these aspects other than the rate may be of interest to particular kinds of firms so you you emphasize um, say, research and development by giving large um, uh, uh, R&D uh, allowances, then you will attract companies that, ha that are biased towards R&D and, and so on. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's much more complex than just thinking about the rate, although the rate is, 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 is quite important. Okay. Um and how does uh, the USA manage to cope with uh, varying corporation taxes? across uh, the USA? Um, I think, is this the Rhode Island question? Because, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, obviously it's the issue about whether you can have different corporation tax rates within different states, and clearly you can. So how do they actually work it to ensure that you don't have the kind of issues that, that was raised, for example, in the referendum about, diff about the, and you've touched on in your paper, about uh, tax competition? There must obviously be an element of that, but how do they actually ensure that that works effectively? I don't know the details of the corporation tax arrangements in the in the states. I'm afraid. I mean, you're absolutely right that the corporation tax issue is a is an international issue, and you know, ideally, we would have uh, a greater level of um, international agreement about uh, how we set those corporation tax rates clearly. I think potentially it is more of an issue when you're looking at a within territory situation uh, because for a company choosing between whether to locate in Scotland as opposed to the rest of the UK, Scotland and the rest of the UK are clearly fairly similar economies so a different level of corporation tax may play a relatively stronger role in influencing how that business decides to locate as opposed to if that business is choosing to locate between um, the UK and uh, a completely separate country. 
I, I'm, I, th I mean, it, I think it is true that within the states, you've got, I think, is it Rhode Island that has this lowest rate by quite some distance and huge number of companies um, <clears throat> nameplating in in Rhode Island. I don't really know how that's handled, but it, the fact that um, not all of uh, U.S. Uh, industry has moved to Rhode Island suggests that there are other issues. Uh, for example, you know, you think about California, which has quite high tax rates, but it also has um, uh, other attractions, the uh, uh, higher education institutions, the um, um, ability to find capital in, in all kinds of different ways, and, of course, a very pleasant environment which maybe is the uh, uh, countervailing force to Rhode Island's low corporation tax rate. Corporation tax is an issue, but only when all else is equal, I suppose. Uh, um, I, now, uh, I've already taken 13 minutes, so I need to uh, move on to the colleagues around the table. First to ask questions will be Jamie, to followed by Jean. Thank you, uh, convener. <coughs> In your uh, paper, you uh, say that the Scottish rate of income tax will operate effectively as a flat tax because you can't vary the rates differently from uh, one another, saying that this implicitly leaves income redistribution as a reserved issue for the UK Government and that this may undermine the extent to which the Scotland Act proposals really meet the desire for greater fiscal policy autonomy. Could you say what you, you mean by that latter point uh, in particular? Well, I mean, I think what the main incentive that the Scottish rate of income tax uh, gives to the Scottish government is to match the rate of growth of the tax base in the rest of the UK. Otherwise, the size of the block grant adjustment will start to exceed the amount of revenue that the uh, uh, Scottish government is raising from this flat tax that you describe. You cannot use that flat tax to uh, alter people's behaviour uh, because you don't control the rates, you don't control the allowances. And you can't really use it to uh, uh, redistribute, again, because you don't uh, control the rates, you don't control the allowances. But we have shown in another paper on inequality in Scotland that it is, you know, even moving uh, tax rates around quite a lot, income tax rates, uh, in Scotland, you don't have a huge effect on overall inequality. And the reason for that is that our, uh, what we call the market or the, or the pre-redistribution distribution of income is very unequal. So even before you apply tax, taxes and give out benefits, you've got such an unequal uh, distribution of income that you won't have a huge effect even if you make fairly big changes to tax rates and tax allowances and, and David has just described how if you move them relative to the rest of the UK there's a danger that you'll, you'll end up with less than you thought you were going to end up with because um, of behavioural responses, people moving or companies moving so on. Yeah, I mean, you've touched on the issue of uh, the, the, the the problems that could be associated with uh, asymmetric growth in the tax base, and that's something we've, we've discussed before, Professor uh, Bell, and you, you described that as the Scottish Government bearing the, the full risks associated with this, but you do see the uh, corollary of this is, of course, that the Scottish Government is fully incentivised to grow the income tax base, but I mean, how, just with control of the, the Scottish rate of income tax in itself, isn't really going to give the Scottish Government that much power to do that, is it? I mean, it still doesn't have control over immigration and, and things like that. Well, that's, that's a good point. It doesn't have control over immigration. So if there are blockages due to uh, inability of um, uh, Scotland to attract the uh, kind of high, high productivity individuals, then uh, that might have a negative uh, effect. Um, although, you know, it, it's difficult to to, uh, to calibrate that um, at the minute. But of course, Scotland does spend very considerably more than the rest of the UK does on economic development. So Scotland, uh, I think, comes second to London in terms of its attractiveness for 
inward investment. So there are levers, uh, and Scotland's chosen to use the economic development lever, it seems, quite well uh, to uh, enhance the growth of the Scottish economy, which should grow the, uh, the uh, uh, tax base. So there are, you know, it, it's not that tax alone will be responsible for growing the tax base. There are other supply side instruments that are available to the Scottish Government which um, uh, could help in that regard. And the Scottish rate of income tax basically means that the Scottish Government uh, will capture some of the positive benefits of economic growth in terms of increased tax receipts, but it won't capture all of those benefits, for example, in terms of reduced welfare spending. So it's, it's giving some incentives, but not completely full incentives. And the other thing, is you, as you've touched on, as, as David's talked about, is that uh, it, it doesn't give the Scottish Government power to um, address income inequality and uh, the distribution of uh, income. Yeah, and, and the, the point that I've made in a previous paper is that if, if the growth in the income tax revenues is, is concentrated on, let's say, bankers' bonuses and, and they are being taxed at 45 pence in the pound, Scotland's only getting 10 of that 45 pence, whereas if it's more about low income or lower income growth, where they're being taxed at 20 pence in the pound, Scotland's getting a half of that increased uh, revenue. Rich, my next uh, question, Mr. Uh, is because um, I wanted to turn to the issue of, because you talked about the reduction in welfare spend in, in your paper, uh, you refer to uh, the UK welfare state being seen as the key element in the risk-sharing resource-pooling mechanism that are seen as the, the defining or a defining characteristic of the union. That's the Labour proposal talk of rights enshrined at UK level that should be paid for from UK taxes. Liberal Democrats talk of maintaining the UK social welfare union. The Conservatives describe the social union as hugely important to what glues us the UK together and you say in this context it's unclear to what extent welfare devolution is compatible with these principles so it seems you're pretty clear it's unlikely that a social security will be devolved but we know that 100,000 more children are likely to be pushed into a poverty as a result of these welfare changes in Scotland by 2020 we know 100,000 disabled people in Scotland have been affected by these changes we know 80,000 households have been hit by the bedroom tax so we are the Tories talk about this being uh, what glues us together. We're getting stuck in the glue. If we don't get any further devolution, do you, do you really not see this as a, a serious prospect? You don't think we'll see the devolution of Social Security to any extent? We were, the point that we were making there was not that we don't think that uh, welfare devolution is on the table or, or, or makes sense, but we were simply, uh, in that part of the paper, making the point that um, the argument for, the, the traditional argument for keeping uh, most elements of welfare spending reserve, not just in the UK, but in, in, in many other countries as well, is that uh, those uh, functions, those welfare spending functions, are um, appropriate to have at a federal, if you like, national level to ensure that citizens in all parts of the countries receive uh, the same level of welfare services and that there's an element of risk sharing over the economic cycle and so on. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, have to agree with the welfare policy that uh, is, is in place at the moment. That, that part of the paper was simply making the point that that's the traditional starting point of the fiscal federalism literature. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just written something that's not published yet on, on devolving welfare. And one way to think of it is that welfare is there to cover a number of risks. Um, and in the in the first instance, I guess when when uh, uh, you know way back when uh, social insurance was introduced in the first instance, it was about insuring against unemployment. And actually, unemployment type benefit, job seekers allowance, now accounts for a smaller and smaller amount of the total welfare bill. And David's just put the point. One argument for having 
unemployment insurance on a kind of uh, national UK level basis is that if if one part of the country suffers a, a big shock, say the, say the oil industry in, in Aberdeen suddenly uh, uh, was, was not doing so well, uh, then this is a, a, the unemployment benefit is actually a subsidy, not just to the individuals in Aberdeen, but to the Aberdeen economy and keeps it more buoyant than it would otherwise have been. So it's a, a form of insurance. Actually, if you look at most of the benefits that are now covered by, sorry, most of the risks that are now covered by welfare, they're not about insurance. They're about things like disability uh, or having, having a need to care or bereavement, uh, these, these sorts of things. In those sorts of circumstances, it's not quite so obvious that um, uh, you, you would be fulfilling this kind of uh, uh, cross-national subsidy to keep the economy going uh, function. And uh, I guess that I argue um, uh, uh, that there's a possibility of, of, of deciding on, let's say, how much a... Scotland currently receives in relation to a particular benefit. Attendance allowances is, is, is one that the Labour Party have selected. And then um, somehow indexing that in the way that the block grant adjustment will be indexed and letting uh, Scotland get on with that sum of money uh, to distribute to, uh, to uh, uh, the disabled. The good thing about that is we already have a policy of free personal care and it doesn't look like these two policies sit all that well together, the attendance allowance on the one hand and the free personal care on the other because they're essentially trying to do the same thing. Uh, and uh, the disadvantage is that you, you, while having a big sum of money, you have to go through the administrative or you have to pay the administrative costs of um, sharing out that money. And even if you do that through DWP, it will still be expensive because the, the welfare system, as you know, is, is extremely, extremely complex. So something not too dissimilar to that is done in US states, and I, I think is worth uh, thinking about in relation to some aspects of welfare spending. And that isn't... Uh, um, it, well, I would just reiterate what, what uh, uh, David said. This is about the design of welfare. It's not about the current policies uh, and, and the levels of support that are available. I, I'm not saying, uh, neither of us are saying anything about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, reading the, the paper, it seems that you have dispensed with the idea of the <coughs> the vow made by other political parties that the Barnett formula would remain untouched. Is that correct? Well, the, um, the Barnett formula is still implicitly there in that the block grant will be, uh, what, sorry, in, under the, um, under the uh, Labour proposals, it, it's pretty clear because it's just an extension of the Scotland Act that the Barnett formula will be there. The block grant will be determined and then it will be adjusted. It will be reduced by an amount that, that uh, the uh, Scottish Government and the UK Treasury will, will agree on. Once you start to uh, increase very substantially the uh, amount of money that's that's been taken away from the Barnet uh, allocation, then it becomes, I think, um, less easy to defend its continued existence. And indeed, you know, it is not just about Scotland. Uh, I was um, uh, present at a meeting on Monday where very strong arguments were being made by uh, Wales, or well, uh, a representative from Wales about how uh, the uh, Welsh government feels, uh, perhaps with some justification, that uh, Wales has done badly out of the uh, Barnet formula for some time. So I would, have, I would have thought that it might come under more pressure if, if there is a, a substantially greater take 
uh, in terms of income tax in Scotland. And there, I suspect, will be pressure from outside Scotland because it's unpopular outside Scotland. You do, I think, suggest several uh, different parts of the paper that we are generously uh, dealt with, really, more or less, because of the oil. We get, we've, we've been, we have this large S uh, that comes, but the reality is that we've contributed far more than ever came back in the Barnett formula through oil revenues. I, I mean, I think the, the, the allocations to Scotland through the Barnett formula are clearly... Um, largely a result of the historic uh, baseline allocation. The, the, the Barnett formula gets a lot of criticism, but actually it's the, it's the, the baseline allocation that means that Scotland is, is funded relatively generously. I mean, in theory, I think, uh, I very much doubt this will happen, but in theory, I think the uh, UK government, if it wanted to, could think about retaining the Barnett formula, but making a one-off adjustment to Scotland's block grant, so retaining the Barnet formula, uh, but, but, but nonetheless uh, reducing the block grant. Anyway, I think you, the, uh, the point that you make is um, ar around oil revenues, and I think there's been a, a couple of pieces of work done that have looked since 1980 at the North Sea revenues uh, that have come from Scotland and compared that to the level of funding that's come back to Scotland through the Barnet formula and uh, over time the two things pretty much cancel each other out so Scotland in effect has received back the North Sea revenues uh, through the through the Barnet allocation not explicitly but that's the the implication implication in, in this paper but I mean I think it's been challenged and found wanting that's really the point that I'm making <coughs> that the um, you know the, the you relatively generous grant is uh, you are linking that to oil, but there is another thought that says that there's about 150 billion uh, that didn't come back. Anyway, we'll leave that. The the other thing I wanted to ask was, really reading the paper, it, it's um, it feels a bit like being hamstrung. I mean, would you agree that that the uh, to devolve the income tax really doesn't leave Scotland in a particularly better place, and the word power might be. Uh, a bit strong. I mean, I would suggest that, you know, real power would mean that we might have power of taxation. Uh, do you think that that's something that should be argued for? Well, I think a number of the proposals argue for full devolution of income tax, including uh, the ability to vary rates individually and the ability to vary bans. Um, that would bring a very large revenue source fully into the control of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, it would give the Scottish Government ability to address issues around inequality and redistribution. Yes, it wouldn't be the full panoply of, of complete tax powers, but relative to uh, other countries around the world, that would really be a very substantial level of tax devolution to a devolved government. And it, uh, it, is, it is true. I mean, even if you've got complete... Uh, uh, powers, Basque country would be, or pretty much com complete powers, the Basque country would be an example. Um, you are always still constrained in your ability to set uh, tax rates uh, and to, uh, uh, well, basically because ultimately markets will tend to... Um, or you'll end up with, with uh, uh, factors of production, labor and capital um, moving in response to uh, differential taxes. I mean, we see that happening all the time. You know, uh, so uh, in a sense, yes, you could uh, leave the constraints of having all of these things set at Westminster, but you wouldn't be unconstrained. That would, that would be uh, uh, a not the correct way to think about it. But we've just... Uh, haven't you just made the case in the paper that there are constraints? There are constraints of, of increasing the tax. We're still tied to an economy that's, that's set uh, around the, the uh, London area and the financial sector particularly. Yeah, so, so I mean, 
I mean, what, what we've been looking at is the existing proposals, and certainly they do uh, impose uh, uh, constraints. Uh, um, and uh, well, any government will will look at its fiscal position and and, and make decisions accordingly. Uh, a, you know, governments have greater or lesser uh, policies towards different parts of the country. Uh, you know, and and arguably the the UK has one that doesn't do that hugely, especially within England. Uh, but uh, a having the tax powers would 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 give you some greater degree of autonomy clearly but it wouldn't be unconstrained if you were to uh write a paper perhaps from a different perspective that was showing the powers that scotland needed in order to to grow its economy uh to develop industries would you <coughs> would you say that it needed the power to create taxes and impose taxes on different aspects of industries in Scotland. I mean, I, I, again, you know, the, 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 there is the issue of uh, probably most, ta most, most companies, you want to grow them, would prefer much lower taxes than, 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 than currently uh, pertain in Scotland. Um, uh, that, that would be one way, of, uh, certainly, of attracting uh, uh, more business to Scotland. Uh, but there are, you know, there are what we call the supply side uh, uh, of the economy, which is about skills, which is about enterprise, which is about infrastructure and so on, which have a considerable bearing on your ability to grow the economy. With, with devolved income tax, really the, the area that we would be... Uh, that would be clear that we should devolve, we, we should uh, develop, would be the financial sector because that's that's the one that's providing the highest income in, t in terms of tax revenues. Is that right? The uh, well, in income in terms of income taxes, it, it's less true now, but it was true certainly uh, a, towards the end, well, towards the middle of the last decade that uh, uh, bankers' bonuses provided a very substantial. Uh, uh, share of total income tax revenues um, and under the current proposals as, and as I mentioned earlier actually Scotland wouldn't get a huge share out of that It'd get 10 out of 45 pence or it was 50 pence for a while uh, uh, so um, it wouldn't benefit to the same extent as the UK government uh, would from from uh, those kinds of um, uh, or that type of income. And um, I think just finally, I mean, we the, the paper refers to the UK as though it's a kind of really well-functioning monetary union, um, that somehow there's an advantage to being uh, tied to it. <coughs> Is that really what you think? Well, I mean, in terms of a you know a monetary union, um, the U.S. is a very good example of a well-functioning monetary union. Uh, I think the U.K. is is a well-functioning monetary union. The uh, euro is not a well-functioning uh, monetary union, partly because uh, it lacks the ability to do the kind of cross. Uh, uh, the fiscal transfers, which uh, support parts of the of the state when they get into trouble. So, the example that Krugman made recently, although perhaps rather crudely, was that Florida uh, and and Greece were in some ways equivalent in the in the kind of um, shock that they experienced during the Great Recession. Yet Florida uh, has largely through the kind of transfers I was talking about earlier, uh, weathered the storm and not really suffered greatly, whereas Greece, which hasn't received significant fiscal transfers due to the uh, policies being followed by the European Central Bank and the European Union, um, uh, is still, you know, has still 60% youth unemployment rates. Um, yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. Michael's report by Gavin.
Thank you. Much convener. Uh, when the convener started uh, his question, he mentioned the, the policies of the, the Labour Party in terms of uh, increasing taxation but not uh, reducing it, the, the ability to do that. And Mr Iser appeared to uh, have uh, a doubt in his mind as to the, the validity of that which the, the convener agreed with. But they then discussed the issue of corporation tax and it, the, the pledge made by the Scottish Government to reduce it by a certain amount, regardless of the level set by the UK Government. And the, the issue of um, you know, tax competition, a race to the bottom, is essentially the, the issue in relation to both of those taxes. A policy which allows you to raise income tax in order to increase the amount of money available for public spending, but a policy which prevents a reduction in income tax to avoid a race to the bottom. What are your concerns over a position like that? Given that you had some concerns over allowing a, a race to the bottom on corporation tax. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair point to an extent. If you look at the, what's happened to income tax rates and corporation tax rates across countries over time, the pattern's very different. Corporation tax rates have been going down in all countries. Income tax rates have, have, have stayed much more uh, constant across countries. This idea that horizontal tax competition always results in lower tax rates isn't, isn't quite right. Uh, f it depends very much on the type of tax and how mobile the tax base is that it's applied to. In terms of income tax, there's evidence that people think much more in terms of, not in terms of tax competition, but more in terms of fiscal competition. So if, if people can see that they are receiving the benefits of income tax through locally provided services, then um, they are generally more willing to accept those uh, higher tax rates. And that visibility of income tax is a key part of the reason why income tax is often perceived as a good tax to devolve, whereas corporation tax isn't, because that link between the tax and locally provided services isn't there. The tax base is very mobile, so you can get this race to the bottom. So the, the issue of horizontal tax competition affects different taxes uh, differently. I think the, the point that I made earlier about uh, income taxes, really just why would you want to constrain a parliament forevermore to only be able to, to operate a tax in, in, in one way rather than another, which is perhaps slightly different from a policy position of saying we will cut the tax if we have it. I mean, this issue of mobility of the tax base is an important one, and, and capital, I think, is more mobile than labour, and that's why, as we've as we've uh, said, corporation tax rates around the world have been coming down because companies uh, are able um, to move relatively easily uh, uh, nowadays, and indeed, the um, overall. It, although it's, it's not as extreme as um, corporation tax, it has become more difficult to uh, raise huge sums w through income tax. It's partly because we now have a lot of relatively poor people who don't pay a lot of income tax. We a lot, have a lot of relatively rich people who are probably quite good at finding ways of avoiding income tax. And the net result of that, which is bad for the poor, is that countries have increasingly focused not on direct taxes, but on indirect taxes. So what happened at the start of this UK parliament was an, an, uh, an increase in VAT rather than an increase in income tax. And the increase in VAT is partly explained by the fact that the tax authorities know they will get their money when they increase VAT by... Uh, uh, a couple of pence or whatever. It doesn't make a huge difference to people's uh, 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 behaviour patterns. Uh, thanks very much for, for clarifying that. But the, the question that I wanted to ask at the outset this morning was in relation to VAT and assignation of the, the tax um, generated in Scotland. Because we know that you, you can't have different rates between Scotland and England un under EU rules. 
So there's, there's a good example there of how you can look to identify the amount of tax raised in a geographic area and assign that, that money via the block grant or whatever. Are there other areas where that could be done or, or are there other ways that it could be done out with the block grant? Well, I mean, that, that's a slightly, uh, slightly different um, approach from the one that I, I uh, described earlier. So the one I described earlier was one where, let's say, you take all the VAT revenues raised in the UK and you give Scotland its population share of it. What you're uh, uh, now uh, uh, interested in looking at is you try to figure out how much VAT is actually raised in Scotland and assign that to uh, Scotland. Well, you could do that with uh, a number of things. Uh, actually, for example, Scotland's uh, uh, per head, um, I've forgotten the exact figure, but it's something like 10%, I think, in terms of alcohol duties, the amount raised in Scotland is something like 10% a head more. So uh, we would get more if we had our proper share of of, uh, of uh, alcohol, no, total alcohol duties. Trouble, uh, you know, that can be done. Uh, the, the difficulty with that is that the incentives you create are perhaps not the best. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you have to be, you have to be quite uh, careful. But, uh, you know, th that ca it's not that unusual to do that sort of thing and, and, and it might uh, increase at a political level the uh, kind of feeling that, well, we're spending the money that's raised in Scotland, but be careful about what incentives you, you end up with. Yeah, that's helpful, thanks very much. Just, uh, Jim's just pointed out in your paper, of course, that it's 16%, uh, yes, not 10%. <laughs> Okay, um, Jean, uh, sorry, Gavin, to be followed by John. Um, what do we need to do in Scotland uh, to build up our capacity at analysing and ultimately then dealing with the concept of behavioural response to taxes? That's uh, really quite a difficult question. The UK experts on this, indeed possibly the world experts on this, are... The, or is the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, in London, and um, the the uh, economists do get quite uh, nerdy about this, and it's uh, it's it's trying to uh, construct a situation which is on the one hand like real life, but on the other where a group one group of people are confronted with a certain tax rate and another group of similar people are confronted with a different tax rate and then you see how they how they respond to it now there have been uh, uh, there's been quite a lot of work done at uh, UK level and in different countries then you've got the question if you look at it um, what do you think how how, com how useful do you think the comparison is between Scotland and these other countries. But if I was to make a general finding from the, the, um, the, the literature that we have now, I mean, it, uh, first of all, the kind of people who, re who react uh, quite a lot to changes in the tax regime are people who are just about on the point of retiring. So they might make a decision, whereas um, people uh, kind of mid-career are less uh, responsive to difference in income tax rates. Sometimes married women are more responsive to income tax rates, but then things like you know, how much child support there is uh, matters. It's clear, although I don't think there's a huge amount of evidence yet, that... Um, Things like tax credits affect people's willingness to supply labour, to, to, uh, to work longer. Uh, because once you exhaust your tax credits, you can suddenly be facing not a tax rate of 40 or 40%, 40 you can be facing a tax rate of 70%. And, and you think, well, what's, 
you know, what's the point of doing that extra hour of work? So there's a need for a body to bring this all together in Scotland. It, it, you know, it does, uh, it does seem to me because clearly as you get whatever powers Scotland will get uh, at the end of this process, um, it's important not only to educate uh, uh, all of the people who, who, who are involved in policy making, but you know the Scottish public more generally, that it, it isn't simply you, you raise the tax and you get X and, and assume that that's the end of the story. In terms of a body, I mean, who, who would you envisage doing that then? Because you know, one, one of the risks with, with any uh, devolution of tax is that if, if, we, if we get our behavioural response element wrong, we could end up not getting uh, 460 million. It could be something hugely uh, lower or, or higher than that, depending on what happens. I mean, how, how, I mean, obviously, through experience, we would get better at it and, and make fewer mistakes. But my, I suppose my slight concern is that we, we have to go through all the pain first before we actually get the hang of it. How, how could we set it up so that we make as, as few mistakes early as possible? Um, well, uh, thinking about the structure in the UK, you've got the Office of Budget Responsibility. In fact, they don't do this stuff, to be honest. They, they look at uh, uh, taxes, and I think they will largely um, be looking at Institute for Fiscal Studies research uh, uh, on this. So... Um, I, you know, there are different possible models uh, that, that, that one could think of, but you have to have one that has a very good pipeline to the types of research, not just the Institute for Fiscal Studies. There's interesting, some of the stuff we've looked at has been in Denmark um, and other European countries has been work in the States, but you have to have that international linkage so that you're up to date with the latest thinking on these uh, on these issues and and it's it's called a applied microeconometrics if you want to know the, <laughs> the correct term <laughs> but uh, we you we really really need to have uh, uh people who are uh, uh uh very much up to speed with the latest thinking on that helpful thank you um I wonder if either of you then could, if I turn to your paper, page 10 of your paper, figure two, uh, headed uh, decentralisation ratios in OECD countries. I wonder if either of you are in a posi position really just to talk through uh, what is going on in that particular uh, chart. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try. Um, so this is looking at um, the share of expenditure and the share of revenue that sub-national governments have in different uh, countries of the world. Um, so, for example, um, if you take the uh, point that's marked UK, Scotland, what that's saying is that of all public spending that takes place in Scotland, the Scottish government's responsible for around 50% of that on the x-axis, but on the y-axis at the moment, of all taxes raised in Scotland, the Scottish Government is responsible for less than 10% uh, of those. And the graph is then plotting all these other OECD countries in terms of the um, expenditure shares and revenue shares of sub-national governments in each of these countries. Now, in some of these countries, the sub-national governments are local authorities. In some of the Nordic countries, for example, local authorities have the ability to vary tax rates and so on. In other countries, you know, these are sort of clearly US states, um, cantons in Switzerland, regions in Spain and, and so on. What we've then done is we've tried to say, OK, well, if we implemented all the proposals of uh, Scottish Labour or the Scottish Conservatives or Devo More or Devo Plus, where would that put Scotland at that point on this graph? I mean, if we, if we take, for example, um, the UK Scotland point, uh, uh, at the, where it is uh, at the 50% and about 8%, the Scotland Act is really about raising taxes. So you go straight up from uh, where you are. The Labour proposals increase taxes, but also increase spending uh, a little bit because there's discussion of 
giving powers over attendance allowance and housing benefit. So the uh, the uh, Scottish Labour is slightly to the northeast of the of the Scotland Act. The Conservatives no more spending powers, but more uh, tax raising powers is vertically above. Well, there is some spending powers uh, uh, vertically above Scottish Labour and and so and so on. So that that's how it works out. So eventually you end up with almost. Um, uh, or a very, very large proportion of um, a both spending and revenue raising, and th that case is the Devo Plus case. Just for the sake of completeness, if, if you were to plot the Scottish Lib Dem proposals in there, where would where would that be on the graph? I mean, if, if it would be. Uh, Sorry, I'm not sure why they, they aren't there, but it would be uh, somewhere around Diva more Diva plus uh, area. Uh, and just for the sake of completeness, it's the figure on the title is 2010, which is probably the most recent figures you were able to get. I mean, has, has anything major changed to any of these other countries in there that, that would sort of make the graph look markedly different? No. No. OK, thank you. Um, all right, I wonder if I can just ask the same uh, initial question then. If you go over the page onto page 11, figure 3, uh, tax power of sub-central governments in OECD countries, can you just again briefly just talk through um, what that chart is telling us? Yes, yeah, so um, one of the things, I mean, j just if you take, if you go back to figure 2 and look at Germany, uh, now Germany um, on that graph the, the lender in Germany would appear to have a relatively high share of revenues raised in Germany, about 30%. But one of the issues is, and this is something we talked about earlier, a lot of the uh, tax taxes that are devolved to German lender are devolved in the form of taxes being assigned. So the lender don't actually have the ability to vary the tax rates or thresholds. What this graph is doing is it's looking at how the taxes on the on the y-axis in, in, in figure two break down in terms of the level of power, if you like, that the subnational governments have over each of those taxes. So it's not necessarily the case that uh, because a subnational government ha uh, has a relatively high revenue share, that doesn't necessarily always translate into it having full autonomy to vary that tax rate. Yeah, the, the power can, it, 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 it may appear that it has a lot of, um, or, or it might be suggested that, that, that it has a lot of control over revenue, but its power is actually more limited because it's sharing more than setting the rates and base. The German one in particular might seem a little artificial because yeah. because a huge proportion of that is is tax sharing only. Okay, I mean again for so you've got all the OECD countries on the left hand side of your chart or, or a number of them, right hand side of your chart are is the UK and and I guess the various proposals for Scotland. I mean again for the sake of completeness, if you had the Scottish Conservative, and indeed the Scottish Lib Dem ones in there, where would they feature? Because they're they're both absent on that chart. Um, I think, well, if you look at the, starting with the Scotland Act um, proposals, uh, we've interpreted the uh, Scottish rate of income tax here as being a, a tax that's almost more like a shared tax than a uh, f full control tax, clearly, given the discussions we've had. So that's reflected in the Scotland Act and the Scottish Labour proposals. Um, sorry, uh, the Scotland Act and the Scottish Labour, the, the, the Scotland Act proposals are where the Scottish Government varies the rate only, but not the base. The Devo Moore proposals give full control over income tax, so the Scottish Government would have control over the rate and the be uh, base for income tax, but Devo Moore also bring in the idea of tax sharing of VAT. Uh, and the Devo Plus proposals are uh, all of the taxes that are proposed for devolution, uh, the Scottish Government would have control to vary the rate and the base. Um, again, I can't off the top of my head remember exactly where the Conservatives and, and uh, Liberal 
uh, Democrat proposals would be, but I think they're somewhere uh, below Devo Plus, but around Devo more. Yeah, they would be. I think they'd be in between the the Labour and and the Devo more. But we, I mean, we could, for completeness, if you like, come back to you with with a graph that has uh, has those in because. Uh, Clearly, the share of the central government determined rate and base would actually be higher for both Scottish Conservatives and Scottish Liberals, but I couldn't tell you the height of each bar. So you to describe what a chart would look like <laughs> yeah. really, in verbal terms. I mean, is, is, is that easy enough to do? I mean, I, I, it would certainly be useful per, personally. I remember off the top of my head, uh, um, one of the issues might be that for some of the taxes, it wasn't entirely clear to what extent the proposal gave power over a base as opposed to a rate, and that might be why uh, we haven't included it here, but I, we can certainly go and have a look at that. I'd be grateful. Um, last issue for me then, just the, um, you talked a little bit about the, the devolution of wealth or at least some, some aspects of it. If, if you were to devolve the whole of welfare, as I know obviously some have, have, have and will argue for, what does that do to what you describe as the vertical fiscal imbalance? Um, well, the, the, the vertical fiscal imbalance is the difference between the uh, uh, spending that the Scottish Government has control over and the taxes that the Scottish Government has responsibility for. Um, at the moment, the Scottish Government already, as you know, has a, has a particularly high vertical fiscal imbalance. In other words, it has responsibility for a lot of spending but not much tax revenue. Most of the proposals or a lot of the proposals key concern is to address that vertical fiscal imbalance by devolving tax powers to uh, the Scottish Government. Now there are some good reasons as well why you might want to devolve some aspects of welfare spending but if you do that you increase this vertical fiscal imbalance even more so the implication is if you want to narrow that vertical fiscal imbalance then you would have to match welfare spending devolution with even more tax devolution yeah and you're, you're talking about um is it 15 billion it's a, uh, uh it's it's of that order so it's 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 income tax plus half of vat something like that okay well i'd one last very quick one convener thank you the devolution of capital gains tax, pros and cons. Uh, I suppose cons uh, potentially uh, fairly mobile uh, tax base uh, would be the the uh, big risk there. I, yeah, I'd have thought, I mean, if, if there are already ways um, around uh, or avoidance of, of capital gains, then they probably would magnify these possibilities if you, uh, if you uh, devolve it. Great talking. Okay. Hey, thanks, convener. Um, it's like Gavin Brown, I quite like tables and figures and things, and I started at uh, table one and uh, page seven, and I mean, the ones that jumped out at me were the ones where Scotland was quite different. And I suppose that was my starting point, is if, if Scotland's in a different position, are they not the obvious ones to give us a, a let us have control over? And so the first one is North Sea Revenue. Um, it would be an easy one. Give us 50%, give us 75% or something like that. Uh, I'm assuming is volatility the main argument against that? Um, not really. I don't think so. Um, uh, you know, it, it is quite common in other states, e.g., Canada, for example, that uh, a share of um, resource uh, revenues are allocated locally. So, yeah. Friend, I mean, the UK side tended to argue that you know, our revenues aren't very, going to be very good in the future, and, and our side tended to argue that they were. So, I mean, it would be a chance to kind of test that if, if they let us have them and see what we could do with them. Yes? That's true. I mean, so, the, I mean, the, the question, I guess, is that if you're going to do this block grant adjustment thing, uh, maybe, I, maybe I was uh, coming to a 
conclusion too quickly, certainly there would be a volatility issue about your adjustment to the block grant because it's, it's, it's even less predictable than income tax is. Um, so that, uh, I mean, it would seem to me, uh, given that there are borrowing powers associated with forecast errors for the uh, um, um, income tax revenues as, as it currently stands, if you were to go down that route, you would have to have increased borrowing powers to cover the uncertainty associated with um, uh, devolving uh, uh, North Sea oil revenues to uh, to Scotland. Do it by giving borrowing powers, or a uh, build in, so that the first few years the assumption would be you would save and build up a fund, which would, would then cover you in the future. Yeah, but would that not require? I mean, uh, there would have to be a quid pro quo in relation to the block grant because the UK would be losing that source of revenue for its own uh, a, a revenue account. So whether you can have put to be it a bit into of a bargaining a, yeah, whether you can put it into a, a savings account is is you know would might be debatable. And the, the risks around the volatility are, are, are the big ones, but the other thing about the North Sea taxes, of course, is that it doesn't give particularly any incentive to the Scottish Government to grow the, the economy. It doesn't give any powers over income distribution or anything like that. So it is really just a source of revenue, albeit a very volatile one. This vertical thing and... And well, we it would help it, solve the yes. vertical thing, but it would solve the vertical thing quite differently from one year to the next. So yes. how you dealt with that would be quite a challenge. OK. Now, the other three, next three down that were quite different for Scotland, when I think uh, one's already been mentioned, was that alcohol. We also have tobacco at 41% compared to what the UK per head have, and betting and gaming at 17%. And I mean, these are all issues where, you know, like health policy comes into them. And I think gambling is one of them. I spoke to a group yesterday and they said that the number one thing they'd like to see Scotland control would be gambling. Um, and, uh, you know, are these then issues that both we could tie in uh, the revenue side and, the you know, our other policies? I mean, it's possible. Um, w one, but again, this issue of um, response comes up just as a, you know, in relation to corporation tax and to income tax. I suspect part of the reason that tobacco duties are much higher in Scotland is not just, I, I, I'm not convinced that, that rates of sm smoking in Scotland are, are, are that much higher, but partly because there may be less smuggling uh, in relation to cigarettes in, in Scotland because of Less, less easy access to um, a... And that would still mean that Scots are paying a lot more tax yeah. because yeah. a lot of English people are buying illegal tobacco. That yeah. might be true. That yeah. might be true. Right. But the, the question then is uh, how far can you press that uh, to uh, get the health benefits that you, that, that you, might, want to, that you might want to do? I, I, it's not a question I know the answer to. The argument for devolving alcohol and tobacco duties is a strong one, as you've mentioned, given the links to devolved spending policy. There are a couple of practical difficulties in devolving these taxes. The, the primary one at the moment is that these are taxes at the moment that are levied on production and importation to the UK, not on consumption. Can so, I ask you, is that difficult to I don't know how difficult that would be to uh, change, but it would clearly it, w it would represent a major change in how the tax is collected. Certainly. Yeah, you, I mean, I think you'd have to you know, charge the outlets. Um, yeah, I, I suspect that might be quite expensive, but uh, it's not impossible. The other thing, and, um, this is something. We, don't quite know the answer to is that related to the the issue of different rates of VAT um, and the sort of EU laws that that, that preclude that. I, I'm not sure to how, uh, to what extent, um, it's really been tested so far uh, around the extent to which you could have different rates of some of these excise duties in different parts of the country. I, I don't, don't know the answer to that at the moment. Well, well, I mean, clearly, you know, the Scottish Government is exploring the issue of, of having a minimum price, and, and, and we'll see how that, how that progresses. 
I mean, I suppose then taking about thinking a step further is the, is the question, instead of starting where we are and adding on some more powers, the other way would be to say, we'll start at the far end of having all the powers and, and then start taking things off. And I mean, the obvious ones, because th this term home rule has been mentioned, which I think is a slightly old fashioned term, but I guess I, I, th I think I know what it means, whereas I don't know what Devo Max means. Um, so, I mean, if we were to be in a position, say, like Jersey, where you don't do foreign affairs, you don't do defence, but at the end of the year, we would just write a cheque to Westminster, here's your cheque for foreign affairs and defence, and we do everything else. I mean, I mean, is that, from a financial point of view, is that, is that feasible? Is that possible? It's effectively what the Basque country does. Um, but uh, you, you have to be in a strong fiscal position to be able to do that. Now, the UK is not in a strong fiscal position, and uh, Scotland wouldn't be, you know, if it, uh, even if it uh, uh, raised all the revenues in Scotland, um, then it would be making payments for things like debt interest, defence, foreign affairs, these, these sorts of things. Of course, if it's making payments, it might want to have, have some kind of a say around how those monies uh, might be used. But the Basque country is, is certainly more affluent than Spain is, so it can go down that line. At the moment, at least, there would be, there would be difficulties because <coughs> um, uh, of Scotland's uh, uh, fiscal position. This is Ms. May, just a kind of practical point. I didn't quite understand it, but on page three, it talks about um, the Scottish government, this is after the Scotland Act, will be responsible for taxes equivalent to around 27% of its spending. And on page nine at the bottom, it says the Scotland Act proposals result in the Scottish government's revenue share increasing to 17%. C can you just clarify? I think that might be council tax not being part of the Scottish government right. effectively. So the 27%, I think, is council tax, um, uh, business rates, um, the landfill tax, the stamp duty land tax, and the income tax, but they're not, right. they can't quite all be described as Scottish government taxes. Right, okay, so the 17% would at least exclude the council tax and, and maybe I think so. some of the rest. Do I? Am I? Yeah, sorry, what, what was the, the second page that you mentioned? Uh, page, it's page three and page nine. It's page nine, it's right at the bottom two lines. Um... I think it, we're talking about two slightly different things here. One is yeah. the percentage of um, all government spending in Scotland, and one is the proportion of existing Scottish government spending, I think. But I, I would have to read it, yeah. read Back it to in it a bit just more detail to that, remind myself of that. I was just yeah. a wee bit confused as yeah. to whether I was comparing yeah. uh, like with like. And I think my final question then would be, I mean, you, you use the word federal in, in your paper, it appears in page nine, paragraph four, and it gets used quite widely. I mean, am I right in thinking that federal doesn't really define how much power is down at the individual state's level? It, it's just more about how the structure works. And, and so the example of Germany is that actually there's not very much power, but it is a federal system. So federal doesn't really tell us how much devolution there is. It just tells us there is a, set, a setup. The theory of this is a kind of a uh, well-known area of economics and the OECD has, a, I think, a website associated with it and, and we call it fiscal federalism. So often the term federal, we, we use that term and it uh, covers a multitude of different arrangements across different countries. Yeah, I mean, it, we probably fall into a bit of a trap that economists use the word federal in a slightly different way than... Uh, political scientists sometimes do, to an economist, fiscal federalism is just the study of which taxation and spending levers to allocate to which level of government. It doesn't necessarily say anything more than that, and we've sometimes perhaps mixed the, the economic and the political notions of the word. 
Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. That's uh, concluded questions from the committee. I've just got a couple of further questions to ask. Uh, on page 19, uh, you say that uh, if tax devolution is accompanied by reform of the mechanism for determining Scotland's block grant, either as part of a quid quo <laughs> pro for more powers or in order to oper operationalise tax devolution in Wales, the Scottish Government's budget may face a decline in its spending power relative to the UK. Now, one of the, th the concerns uh, we have on this side is basically is that um, it, powers may be devolved, but not necessarily budgets. For example, when the council tax benefit was devolved a few years ago, only 90% of the budget was devolved with it, so we ended up with a £40 million shortfall that the Scottish Government and the local authorities had to make up. Is that a, an issue of concern to you? I, th I mean, I think you have to... Um, ..separate... Uh, um, powers that are being uh, devolved from the overall uh, f the macroeconomic fiscal stance. So the question really is uh, if you are still part of a union then uh, one of the defining characteristics of a union is that the union determines the macroeconomic st the, you know, fiscal stance. So powers can be uh, devolved, but if the fiscal stance is one which is saying that there has to be cutbacks on the uh, on the overall deficit, then you can get this uh, uh, um, situation where you have both a sudden you're suddenly getting new powers, but also a reduced budget to to deal with that issue. But but they are, in a sense. Uh, separate issues. The question is who controls what and uh, I guess the argument would be that mostly the central state gets to determine the overall macroeconomic stance. Whether you know in other countries other other uh, or other government governmental organizations get to debate that issue then it's is, is a fair question to raise, but but the UK has traditionally, you know, this has been the uh, the uh, it's been the, the treasury which has uh, determined this this issue. So we should expect that's policy control, but not fiscal control. Right. I uh, <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Well, there's something I would like to comment on. It's on page 18, uh, and you say that is, uh, and I quote, there is perhaps a danger that unionist parties are raising expectations beyond what is feasible for political reasons. Um, what are the proposals that are not feasible that are being made? My, wor my worry about this to some extent is that the powers um, over taxation aren't the be-all and end-all as far as economic growth is concerned. That, and, and I've kind of gone into that issue, issue uh, uh, recently, that um, they will uh, increase the accountability of the, the, uh, the, Scottish, the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament, uh, and they will um, create certain incentives for it uh, for the Scottish Government to ensure that the Scottish economy grows as fast as possible. Uh, but this is not, you know, these tax powers in and of themselves are not necessarily the key to seeing the Scottish economy grow substantially faster than the rest of the UK. Okay, thanks. I think an, an, another point on, on just on the comment that you quoted. Um, wasn't necessarily just related to tax powers as well, but of course we haven't talked quite so much today about the various proposals for welfare devolution, and, and some of those relate to uh, or propose devolving sort of bits of tax credits or a bit of an employment programme, and there are potentially a lot of practical political difficulties around uh, that as well, uh, which I think that, that comment was alluding to. And just to seek clarification on the point that both Michael and I raised with regard to corporation tax and income tax, is it not the case that the devolution of corporation tax would allow corporation tax to be raised if a government so wished, as opposed to be lowered, whereas Labour's proposals are simply to be able to raise income tax to a level but not have the power to reduce it? You could raise it. I mean, uh, uh, you could... Uh,
potentially uh, redesign it. Um, it is true, as we both said, that the tendency has been over the last 20 or 30 years to see corporation tax rates internationally mm, tend uh, towards the Irish rate, which is the minimum rate of 12.5%. Uh, you know, there's, most countries have some way to go to get there, but there's, it's absolutely clear that corporation tax rates have been coming down. And any further points that you wish to make before we conclude? Okay, thank well, you. thank you very much for responding to all our questions. Uh, I'm going to call a five minute recess to in order a change of witnesses.
join us uh, very shortly. Our next item of business today is the evidence in a round table format from representatives of three community planning partnerships uh, from Glasgow, Murray and North Ayrshire. And I therefore like to uh, welcome uh, to the meeting uh, Lynn Brown, Deputy Chief Executive and Executive Director of Finance and Jim Gray, Head of Democratic Services at Glasgow uh, City Council. So uh, welcome. Uh, Laura Freel, Executive Director of Finance and Corporate Support, North Ayrshire Council, and Iona Colvin, uh, Director of Health and Social Care Partnership, also at North Ayrshire Council and NHS Ayrshire and Arm. And welcome to you. Uh, and Roddy Burns, Chief Executive of Murray Council, and Pamela Gowns, Officer, uh, Chief Officer of Health and Social Care Integration at NHS uh, Grampian. Now, the way this, uh, this roundtable format works, it's something we're very familiar with on this committee, uh, is that I shall be asking... Uh, one of our uh, witnesses to, to kick off, and that'll be Lynn, who has been forewarned, albeit with only three or four minutes notice, but <laughs> nonetheless. And what will happen then is that uh, after Lynn um, uh, um, uh, responds to my initial question, anyone who therefore uh, thereafter wishes to contribute, please just let me know, just kind of put your hand up or nod or whatever, just to get my attention, and we'll take people in sequence. You can come in as often as you can, uh, we may have cross discussions in which you can ask questions of other witnesses, etc., etc. Et if things start to slow down and we start to get bogged down a little bit, I may stimulate proceedings by um, picking one of you at random and, uh, and uh, quoting from your submissions. So be on your toes. Okay, so Lynn, um, I'm going to start uh, this uh, roundtable session by asking you to provide an update on the following evidence uh, which was given to Finance Committee in 2010 as a part of the sp preventive spending inquiry. And I quote, We are at the early stages of implementation of Glasgow's early intervention programme and we need the results and early indications of how well we are doing before we can determine what to do in shifting resources. The intergenerational issue is that we are constantly responding to different pressures in terms of the deprivation in a city such as Glasgow and to be very honest about it, I'm not sure that we will ever tackle it absolutely. Now, four years have since elapsed, so I'm just wondering what progress has been made in, over those uh, four years. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. There's been a significant amount of progress um, in Glasgow in those four years, and that was reflected in the audit of committee planning by Audit Scotland, who said we had made progress. And in fact, since that report has been published, we've, we've made more progress around joint resourcing, which I can speak about. Uh, the, the key to us was in 2012, and um, part of it was we completely overhauled our structures. So first of all, a board was put in place that's um, chaired by Bailey uh, Aileen Colleran, who's made significant progress. And on that board, we have got the statutory uh, uh, organisations that should be involved, plus a few others. We've got the Wheatley Group, um, who look after social housing in a large proportion of Glasgow. Um, and we um, have got um, some other people as well with the voluntary sector. Um, underpinning that, maybe I should just say about the board, the board at that level has got board chairs from these organisations, so it's very much at the highest level. Underpinning that is an executive group that is chaired by the chief executive, and on that it has chief executives uh, from those organisations, plus a few others. We've also got the DWP on that, and Skills Development Scotland, and also the colleges. We overhauled our actual um, more local uh, structures and we have now got 21 area partnerships um, and they uh, report into three sectors, two in the north, um, northeast, northwest and the south of the city um, and they report right through the community planning so there's been a real um, hard look at our structures and our views that you have to have the structures right and the right people there at the right level to make progress um, and that was reflected in the report. Uh, one of the things that's come through the Audit Scotland report and is, I know is a frustration for um, the Scottish Government as well, is the lack of progress around joint resourcing and budgeting. And again, there's been, um, with the National Committee Planning, chaired by um, Pat Waters, uh, we've made progress in that. We took the view in our um, community planning to focus on, be a bit more targeted. We've also got, the, obviously, the national priorities, but we've been targeted on areas that we think, as a community planning partnership, we can actually make progress in. And there are three uh, main areas for us. There's uh, youth employment, there is alcohol, and there's a vulnerable, and it covers two areas. The first one is homelessness, which we're looking at first of all, and the second one is um, uh, to do with uh, in-work poverty. And we are looking at joint resourcing there, and I was tasked before Christmas to set up a, a group that looks at that, and we've got all the directors of finance on that group 
um, looking at our budgets and we've made real progress already on youth employment um, and we've got processes in place for the other two. So that is a real high level in terms of how we've been tackling it since uh, 2010. And our view uh, is that we are, um, have made progress, but there is significant more work to be done. If I can just refer to before I let uh, Jordan and other people in, it said the Accounts Commission was encouraged by the clarity of purpose and direction of Glasgow Community Planning Partnership and said that the CPP has made an important shift towards a more long-term preventive approach to public services that aims to break the cycle of poverty and poor health. Um, and within the three priorities, the Accounts Commission found that you need the, the CPP needs to address how it identifies, allocates and redirects resources to fulfil those. Mm -hmm. And it did say that only a small proportion of the total level of spending available is currently ad allocated to those three priorities? Yeah, the, the first thing is we're trying to establish exactly what those amounts are. So for youth employment, we have worked out across the city, it's about um, 148 million is spent on youth employment across a whole range of agencies uh, in Glasgow, including the voluntary sector. And that took a bit of work to, to get that in place. Um, that is for, that's our 13-14 budgets. Um, we also agreed and we put in, in all our budget um, papers for all um, partners in the community planning partnership that we are committed to joint resourcing and looking at it. But um, we are looking at areas that we feel we can make most um, uh, progress in. Um, the next stage is the alcohol that's been led by, we're leading on the youth employment, the council is, alcohol has been led by uh, health um, and we've just started the work on that and the figures are quite, quite minimal, they're about 40 odd million or so. Um, but again, we'll progress on that to be made and homelessness is the next one. And at this point we cannot say across the city how much is getting spent on homelessness we could say for the council for example but not across the city in terms of budgets the the um, and the scale uh, the uh, council commission in the report I think there's a figure of about four billion for the spend in Glasgow um, and they break it up and there's about 1.3 for the city itself um, a lot of that spend is to do with um, DWP spend is to do with loans charges to do with employee costs so we've decided to take a more targeted approach <coughs> in these um, hard to reach areas and hard to deal with areas, first of all. John? Yeah, thanks, uh, convener. Yeah, just for a bit of clarification, I suppose, as, as to what's actually happening as compared yeah. to structures and kind of planning and things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for example, in 3.3, it, it talks about a joint resourcing to gain a holistic understanding, analyse and assess, consider, quantify and consider which all suggests to me we're still at the kind of preparatory stage. Um, whereas I, my impression was, and we'll hear from the other CPPs later, that actually some things were beginning to happen on the ground in other areas. Mm -hmm. Or am I misreading that? Um, no, there's, there's maybe the distinction is between um, calculating the amount that's spent and actual uh, developments on the ground. So there's a lot happening in youth employment mm -hmm. in terms across the city and different agencies that are involved. We're trying to get a, a sort of understanding of what the resources that go into that and we're also getting an understanding of where maybe there's duplication or where we can be more focused and they start the youth employment as the first priority they started about a year ago um, and they had a a, um, a a sort of a summit i think is the word and um, where the, all agencies in the city came together to talk about what they do and to talk about what they want to achieve and we're building on that so um also in I should say also as part of the um, community planning, we've also got, we're looking at reducing reoffending, we're looking at our early years and also the thriving places agenda as well. So there's another of aspects as well as the priorities, national priorities. But in terms of um, putting a process in place and a methodology that would work for looking at joint resourcing, we're starting with those three priorities and all the partners um, are on board to um, support that. Oh, yeah, I have There's no mad rush to uh, uh, ask things, so I shall um, continue. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim Gray, um, in terms of capital planning, uh, Glasgow says a further emerging element of the work of the Joint uh, Resource Working Group is around capital planning. I'm just wondering if you can talk us through that a wee bit. The, this is uh, very much a, a, an outgrowth of the discussions around joint working and resourcing. Um, again, uh, 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 picking up on the point that uh, 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 Mr Mason made that um, uh, uh, it's not that nothing's been happening before, it's trying to uh, look at it in a more systematic way uh, and make it the norm rather than um, the uh, 
if you like, uh, opportunistic or um, by chance. In other words, trying to work towards a position whereby the partners uh, share with each other uh, at an early stage um, the uh, capital project ideas, the opportunities uh, that they have, look at uh, where the, the more can be done by coming together to, to uh, look, rather than looking at a project simply in isolation. Um, um, so far, we've been in discussion with colleagues in health um, around the uh, refresh program uh, of health centres. Um, now, some of that's already in progress in Glasgow, for example, uh, in the Gorbals. Um, we're now looking at some other areas of the city uh, in discussions with uh, colleagues in health where uh, we can also take the opportunity to uh, make clear linkages between uh, the integration of health and social care uh, programmes um, to look at where we can, uh, at an early enough stage, plan uh, joint capital expenditure because I think a large part of the problem has been uh, in community planning over the last 10 years has been um, the, oh, we don't have time at the moment or it's too late. So we're trying to forward plan and to build that uh, uh, much more into the, the, the heart of the, the, the budget setting process at an early stage. John? Um, yeah, on that, um, I mean, you also, another example you give in 313 is a housing development between Glasgow City Council and the Wheatley Group. I was wondering if you could expand on that because, in a sense, all a housing development in Glasgow is linked to Glasgow City Council, is it not? Uh, absolutely. I think what we're, we're looking at there is looking again for added value opportunities. Again, it's not that we haven't been doing it, it's looking at what can we learn. Um, there's some very good examples uh, from uh, Wheatley Group or GHA. Um, uh, for example, we have a, a very successful uh, programme, uh, it's colloquially known as Environmental Janitors. It's a job uh, skills training programme. Um, we're looking at opportunities in terms of uh, uh, investment, housing investment as it happens, where are the potential for social economy developments, etc., in local areas. So it, it, it's really trying to integrate the housing investment work uh, into the broader agenda of uh, economic development and social inclusion. Okay, um, Gavin? Anything so far. It's really just throwing something out and something that I think as a committee would be useful to hear from any of our uh, witnesses today. We've obviously looked at preventative spending as a committee over the last three years now, I think, in terms of this budget. Two, two things that personally I, I would find really useful for, for anyone to, to uh, comment on. The first one is, in terms of preventative spend, it takes a long time uh, in order to get results, and I, I think we have to be patient. But from what your organisation has done in the last, say, three to four years, are there any initial results that you have seen that you can point to in a tangible way that you can hold up as areas where you think you've, you've been successful? Um, and there may not be a huge amount of that so far, but if there are any, it would be very interesting to see. Uh, but secondly, what are the th given that, that budgets uh, are tight, what are the things that you have done less of? Um, because in order to put additional resources into preventative spending, the money would have to have come from somewhere. So what are you doing less of? Um, and what are the results of, from that so far as well? Just again, it'd be useful to get any, any tangible uh, examples of that. Well, Iona, I notice in uh, North Ayrshire's report, you say that uh, the Family Nurse Partnership was already demonstrating positive benefits, and that's an initiative that this committee actually championed. I wonder if you can uh, uh, talk about that and indeed other areas. Yep. Um, the progress um, has been yeah, made. Family Nurse Partnership certainly beginning to show uh, evidence of um, improvement. In fact, in the heat tar latest heat targets for Ayrshire and Arran, for the first time, we're beginning to see uh, lowering in terms of teenage pregnancy and an improvement in breastfeeding. So that's very welcome. We're not absolutely sure one links to the other, given that the Family Nurse Partnership deals with a relatively small number of families. But I was uh, lucky enough to go along to their open day a couple of weeks ago, really, and meet the families and it really is uh, quite inspiring in terms of looking at uh, the numbers of babies there and the numbers of uh, dads there actually uh, p contributing to parenting as well. So it's quite uh, remarkable in terms of um, some of uh, just that uh, whole involvement of parents with their children and that improvement. So um, we'd certainly encourage uh, people to do that if you get the opportunity to do that. Um, I think, so we're beginning to see some outcomes there and we will obviously evaluate 
but we know it's a very is a tried and tested program and we know that it has a good evidence base there's a couple of other things we're doing the relatively small things i suppose the most obvious one is our, our multi-agency domestic abuse response team which is a joint initiative based in kilmarnock police station um, and that's with scra as well and that has had an immediate reduction on the numbers of uh, young people being referred to the panel particularly younger children actually and the, in terms of the time reduction that women mainly women not only women but women have to wait for a response and um, so it's having a major impact and for the first time this year we've actually seen a decrease in domestic violence now neither we nor the police would claim one is absolutely linked to the other but but we are obviously tracking them so that's that's been something that's been very encouraging and we've put additional resource into uh, the multi-agency domestic abuse team and we're, we're at the moment discussing with the police how, as you'll know, the police have moved to these concern hubs. How do we jointly uh, resource the concern hubs and actually join up some of that adult, child and, and public protection a bit better? Um, and they obviously want to do that on a pan Ayrshire basis. So I suppose one of the things through health and social care integration has been a, an improvement in terms of those relationships across Ayrshire because we work across three councils with the health board and uh, we have progressed significantly with the um, partnership and so we have had a shadow arrangement for our health and social care partnership since the 1st of April and I'm the chief officer for that and um, which means that I manage all the health and social care resources within that partnership and in Ayrshire and Arran we have agreed to put uh, in uh, all of uh, health services apart from the two big district general services into the partnership and uh, all of in North Ayrshire Council all of the health and uh, all of the social work service so that's for children and for criminal justice um, so that's progressing we have a management team appointed and we have a shadow board and we are about to uh, develop a strategic plan which will set out the priorities for service development and redesign and in that we will also talk about what we're going to do less of <coughs> because we have to do less you're absolutely right do less of something in order to do more um, the council has invested in children's services particularly around prevention and early intervention and made money available i think about two and a half million laura something like that yeah uh, which doesn't sound a lot, but in North Ayrshire terms, is a significant amount of money. And, and with that money, uh, we've really looked at early years work and uh, combined and integrated teams going into the early years services. So there's a number of initiatives uh, going on that are beginning to show uh, results. Um, but we know it's about moving the mainstream. And really, I think the next iteration, when we, we produce the strategic plan for the integration partnership, that will begin to move the mainstream, really. Okay, uh, very much. Um, I'm just going to let you in in a wee, a, a, a wee minute, Laura. I mean, I noticed that uh, North Ayrshire Council actually has been uh, uh, commended for its multi-agency approach by the Scottish Government as a night of national best practice, and I believe that the the multi-agency domestic abuse team has also received a number of accolades, and as indeed as the No Knives Better Lives campaign. Um, I was going to ask you though, but uh, um, about the initiatives to make young people war work ready. I wonder if you can talk to us about that. But first of all, uh, Laura, um, if you want to come in with the point you were going to make. To build on what Iona had said about um, moving resources into early intervention and prevention, it was or it is part of the council's budget strategy to disinvest in some areas to, to, to create the opportunity to invest in early intervention and prevention. Iona has given um, a couple of examples, but we've also uh, diverted money into economic development to invest in youth employment, uh, you know, business uh, work, the work that we want to do with uh, with the business sector, because we, we recognise the importance of that as part of the the, the overall uh, journey for the council. So it is part of the council's uh, budget strategy. One of the things that we have started to do, and we've got no um, historic trend information on it, but we're starting, certainly as, as a council, to look at how much of our spend is reactive and how much of it is early intervention and prevention so that we can track if we are doing uh, what we say we intend to do in terms of making that, that shift in expenditure. So there's no trend information just now, but as part of our approach to budgeting, we are tracking um, early intervention and prevention spend. Can I just ask you on that? I mean, how easy is it to split the expenditure into bits? Because, I mean, it's some expenditure that you might say is reactive, but it's also preventative for something else. Are you able to do that? Chair, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's not black and white what's early intervention and what's reactive spend. But what we have done is 
uh, we each director looked at their spend and uh, tried to make that split between react reactive and early intervention and prevention. And we then went through a peer review kind of process to kind of test that to be sure where we classifying the expenditure correctly. So, so that we had a strong baseline that as we move forward, we can see if we're actually making progress in that shift in expenditure to early intervention. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, myself and, uh, and uh, Michael and indeed Jim uh, uh, held a North Ayrshire Employability <coughs> Workshop in Ardrossan. Uh, we took evidence from uh, a number of organisations um, uh, there looking at em employability and there were a number of concerns that were actually raised by sectors such as business sector, third sector in particular. Which is in North Ayrshire, there's myriad policies and schemes in place to deal with employability. Uh, layers of government, obviously Scottish local government, all with interests and targets, often competing, lack of a common set of objectives, funding, in which partner gets credit for um, for various outcomes. Um, I mean, one employer, for example, said that uh, public sector agencies, including the council, were persistent but not joined up, uh, and. Um, there was a feeling that, that had, there was actually in 2012 less of a, 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 a um, um, joining up in partnership working of agencies in 2012 than there actually had been a couple of years before. So I'm just wondering what progress is made to try and reverse that and have a much more seamless delivery. I mean, I realise there's been significant progress since then in terms of reducing uh, levels of youth unemployment, etc. in North Ayrshire, but what progress has been made in terms of this cross-agency working um, um, in North Ayrshire? Thanks, Chair. I can probably speak at a very high level about some of the things that are happening in uh, North Ayrshire to um, make that a, a much better uh, uh, relationship across across the sector. Um, team, team North Ayrshire, I don't know if, if maybe some people have heard of Team North Ayrshire, but Team North Ayrshire, that, that brand or that approach has been um, established to um, deal with the very issues that you've raised about knowing who to speak to, which agencies get responsibility for, for which aspects of um, eh, the, the, the relationships um, across the sector. Um, the, the brand was launched about a year ago, um, and there's, there's, there's further work on it just now, or further eh, eh, progress being eh, kind of showcased, if you like, just now. And that, that's very much about the relationship between the Council, Scottish Enterprise, Irvine Bay, which is our a, a local regeneration company, but also the work with a Job Centre Plus, Skills Development Scotland, um, and the Ayrshire College. And the, the, the approach is about being clear about um, what, what the business opportunities are for growth within our top 150 businesses, single points of contact for those businesses, so that it's not a trying to work your way or figure out who it is you need to, to speak to, uh, to 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 move things along. Um, so that's that's something that's uh, very much a, a I was going to say work in progress, but I think the feedback that we're getting from uh, the businesses. Um, of the, the difference that that is making for them is, is very, very positive. Um, and tying back to the um, issue of uh, employment and, and in particular um, youth, youth employment, it's about understanding what these businesses need and ensuring that we are getting people in a place with the right skills so that they can fill the, the, the employment opportunities as the businesses develop. Thank you, Michael. To be followed by Roddy. <clears throat> Thanks, convener. It, it was in relation to that, that issue that you raised. The thing that struck me and I took away uh, from that visit to um, to Ardrossan was the the frustration of a lot of the agencies that were involved in delivering, you know, what, what were essentially Scottish government policies. That they could tell you how much money they were putting in, they could count the number of people who were going through the system, but there was a, a real sense that the outcome wasn't all that it could have been. So what you could measure, you, you know, they were ticking all the boxes, they were, they were getting the good numbers through, they were getting the right money to the right places. But there was a, a real frustration amongst a lot of the agencies that were involved in that, that partnership that had they not been constrained by some of the, the tick box aspects of, of the, the process, that they could have had better outcomes for a lot more people. For example, uh, people who were placed with uh, firms or were you know, on training courses where they, they were restricted to 13 weeks, where 16 weeks might have got that person into a position 
where they could have sustained themselves, you know, going forward. But at the end of 13 weeks, the, the course ended and that was it. They, they had to move on and someone else came in. So you count that next person as another person who's gone through the system. But the actual outcome was less than it could have been. And is that a frustration that, that, is, that goes beyond our drossing, basically? Um, really just to give some it can be some perception of how we are tackling similar issues in Murray uh, and how we've tackled them is through uh, we obviously have the community planning board which is underpinned by five partnerships and one of those is the economic partnership uh, and that's the partnership that's driven uh, the response to a similar issue around the mismatch between skills uh, and, and jobs because that is what the issue is uh, in Murray it, you know it, it's not just about jobs it's about the skills for those jobs so what it's resulted in in terms of outcomes is close working with, in our case, it's Highlands and Islands Enterprise with Skills Development Scotland, and probably more importantly, the private sector in the shape of the Chamber of Commerce and individual businesses who have, in some cases, funded quite substantial programmes, such as Career Scotland, uh, to give young people an understanding of the world of work and also an understanding of how to prepare for work uh, in all its shapes and forms. So that's certainly been a way of taking some of the frustrations out. And also some quite challenging discussions because when uh, we spoke to employers, uh, what they were looking for was skills in English and maths, the STEM subjects. When we look closely at our um, attainment levels, we struggle in English and maths. So there's an issue there in terms of how we deliver the curriculum and how we improve. So that's brought about some really interesting discussions about how we deploy resources in schools and what we need to do in the future. So I think, if nothing else, what community planning has added is that kind of discussion and I think that the whole prevention plan is the next logical step uh, from where we are in community planning certainly from a Murray context. I mean one of the things in, in your submission which differs from our submissions is uh, the question was asked about sharing of best practice. There's a myriad um, different um, sharing of best practice in your um, submission relative to the others. I'm just wondering if you can talk us through some of those uh, um, how you're working with other um, CPPs and other organisations out with CPPs to share best practice? I think, I think it's probably a reflection of two things. I think, first of all, um, rather like Glasgow, um, you know, we had to do quite a bit of refresh around the board, the board structure, and indeed the whole community plan. Uh, so the natural thing to do is go away and look where best practice is in, in the country and indeed elsewhere. So that's partly an explanation for that. I think the second explanation is that because of the size and scale of Murray, we do have to share. Uh, and some of that's just about the way the service is because we look, we look west uh, in terms of uh, enterprise and the college network, uh, University of Highlands and Islands. We look east in terms of the health network in terms of NHS grampians. So it's a natural thing to do. And I think, I'm not saying that we're doing anything better than anyone else, but I think it's, you know, it's a natural tendency we have to look out with our boundaries and out with our own skills and resources quite often to get what we need to address uh, the particular issues or the challenges that we have in, in, in Murray. Thank you. Now, Pamela, in terms of disinvestment, where are, what, what um, uh, decisions have been taken in terms of disinvestment in Grampian in order to reallocate resources uh, where they would have a, a greater, more positive impact? I mean, I don't think at this point I can give you a definitive answer on that because it's a bit like has been described by others um, giving giving statement that um, th this is a bit of a challenging process to 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 work through. I think the opportunities as as we go forward uh, do sit around um, the the relationships between the community plan and partnership and and the pa five partnerships. One of which is the health and social care partnership, which I'm chief, chief officer for. Um, how we um, do our budget set and how we agree, uh, you know, in terms of our line of sight of where we're trying to go to, what, what we think is possible. We are um, as uh, very similar to Iona, although uh, we are looking at adult and older people's services within the partnership in, in, in the first instance, uh, looking at uh, what budgets are going to be devolved, first of all, out of NHS Grampian into Murray, uh, and then within Murray we will need to, to look at the distinction between where, where we uh, put our focus and our target. And I 
do you believe that the strategic plan, the relationship with the community planning partnership is going to be key to getting that right and driving our, our disinvestment and investment in, in, in the right direction? So I think we're in that kind of transition period um, where I, I think it's very hard to, to say that we've re truly d disinvested in, in uh, current activity. Um, you, you, know, you have a nice list of all the activity that we have there and one of the observations from the Commission and I think one of the observations from our report would be that some of that would have happened um, as a result of investment through preventative spend, perhaps not a disinvestment and, and, and transfer of money. So that, that's the kind of uh, task, I think, in hand as we um, develop and mature in, in, in the coming months. OK, I mean, it's just that we've been talking about this for a long time and I'm, I, I'm disappointed and surprised that there hasn't been anything more concrete. I don't know if, the other, if Glasgow's got anything that they want to, to, to mention on this, because <coughs> Glasgow in the past were, were particularly concerned about how they would disinvest. So I'm, I'm keen okay. to see what, what has been done. Um, in terms of how we, we would view the disinvestment, we looked at our uh, budget strategy and we decided that... Um, we were spending money on things we didn't need to spend it on, and it was totally around property. And we had 19, 19 city centre properties, um, and we reduced it to six. And that gives us uh, a revenue saving of about six million a year. Uh, so, you know, over 10 years, we've got 60 million. And that was the financial strategy, so you could put resources or you could uh, focus on social work and education. So it may not necessarily be within the budget itself within those um, departments that you disinvest or whatever, you can do it at a strategic level and we've been doing that. We've also um, set up, um, we've um, now got a customer business service of which two and a half thousand staff are in it, including all the Revs and Ben staff, all the staff that work in the schools in terms of clerical and that's to get um, that's to get synergies of service and that's also to be able to, to deal with uh, peaks and troughs of work etc. What I'd like to maybe add something slightly different is what we have found is that um, one of the ways where you can have preventative spend, and quite often the gain from preventative spend isn't in the council, it's in other agencies. So it'll be in DWP, it'll be in the police. Um, and one of the ways you can do it is um, where you just work better with um, partners. And we have got a couple of examples I'd like to maybe share with you, Chair. Um, and the first one was uh, um, to do with uh, Glasgow's Health and Heroes, and uh, Mr. Mason may be familiar with this, it's sort of um, based in Duke Street. And what we found out a few years ago was that um, we had about 200 homeless veterans in the city, um, and they, uh, it was a real issue. And we have now got a holistic approach. It's actually run by SAFA, which is the Armed Forces family, and they employ the staff. We've got the Combat Stress in there, we've got Poppy Scott, and a whole range of agencies. And the main key agency getting in there was the weekly group in the GHA for housing. And we've now got a, a, a Glasgow Veterans Programme. And the actual amount of money being put into that by the council is probably um, not even six figures. And we have now got no homeless veterans in Glasgow. Only one has not sustained their tenancy. We have got 300 of the, another veterans in jobs. So, so our way of working can be a preventative spend. And that's how we see we're preventing real issues in terms of health, in terms of housing. And the other one is, um, I think, all the long-term conditions, and that's with health and with uh, Macmillan. Um, and, what they, and that is, again, dealing with um, social worker there, housing are there, other agencies. And this is people who, who, who got cancer. And the, the main thing, from, uh, apart from their health, was that they, they were in danger of losing their homes. They get into real financial difficulties. And since we set that project up in 2010, I think we've got about 40 million in benefits to these people. Um, and Macmillan Cancer support have said Glasgow is the only city in the UK where you aren't at risk of losing your home if you get cancer. So we're, so it's not just a case of major shifts in spend, it's working differently, working with other agencies who are, can be more trusted. You know, the, the veterans um, organisations are more trusted than social work or, or the council um, by the people they're dealing with. So we, we've done a bit of a mix strategically, shifting resources, not spending money where we, we have um, spent it before and more organic in terms of these organisations. And I just maybe add in as well in terms of, uh, again, was our, in terms of our youth employment, we took a view around apprentices linked to the Commonwealth Games and we have put 5,000 young people through apprentices and most of that was with the business community. So there's different levels. I would say that you can do preventative spend and different ways of, of tackling it. And really 
letting different organisations play to their strengths. And some of those organisations are more trusted than others when they're dealing with, with uh, clients. Thank you very much for that. It's very interesting. I take it there's been, if you're reducing the number of um, facilities from 19 down to 6, mm -hmm. you're going to look for a capital receipt for that? Yes, a capital uh, receipt. We had to do two things. We've got, we, we agreed that I think we got about 40 million capital receipts, mm -hmm. um, but we had to invest about 27 million in the new facilities because mm -hmm. it's all open plan and, 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 uh, and to have that, you've got to have the technology. Um, so we agreed that would be the case, but there is a revenue saving every year over and above that. Excellent. Ready? Just, uh, Thank you. just three very quick points. Really, just to echo what, what, what Lynn has said in terms of budget strategy uh, and, and everything that's been done clearly on a different scale in Murray is being done very much uh, similarly to what's happening in Glasgow. So, for example, we've taken 12 offices out of, of the main town in Murray, 20, population 25,000, and we're down to one with a quarter of a million pounds saving in revenue and clearly potential capital receipts. Also, that bit about there's more ground to be covered in terms of prevention. I think we can all do a bit more, and I think all the partners recognise that. But thirdly, and probably more importantly, some of the barriers are often quite indirectly proportionate and quite indirect in, in all senses to the resolution. So, for example, uh, the labour market can often be a determining factor in something as simple as a number of carers you might wish to recruit. Uh, if, for example, some of the retailers are on a pre-Christmas drive, uh, Murray has got a low wage economy, and that can be a determining factor for many individuals as whether they want to sustain uh, a job as a carer or whether they want to take something more attractive uh, for, for the season. Uh, and you know, that, that's just the reality, and, and that's a driver that's clearly you know, out with our control uh, in, in many senses. But it's just a, sometimes important to recognise that there are underlying issues that are quite profound in terms of actually delivering uh, a service, and particularly one, a preventative one. The Commission acknowledged uh, the good record that Murray has in partnership working, but noted, and I quote, that much of this has been achieved without the leadership of the CPP and as a result of reacting to national policy or specific local initiatives. I think that's fair. I think that's fair comment. I think that uh, what I would be comforted in um, is the fact that the findings of, of the Commission do recognise that there, are, there now is leadership there, uh, and there is that good partnership working. So. The comfort f from, from my perspective, and I hope for the assurance that you, you have uh, uh, convener in terms of the scrutiny, um, is that with that leadership and with that partnership working, then the, the, the plan that's now in place, and as I mentioned earlier, the prevention plan is the next logical step uh, from that, and that was also acknowledged by the controller of audit uh, in, in, in his uh, submission to the, the Accounts Commission earlier this year. Uh, I, I think Murray is well placed to take it forward, and I think, again, as someone said, this does take time. Uh, but as I say, I think it, we are moving in, in, in the right direction, uh, and I think that uh, you know the partnership uh, with that leadership will, will produce the required outcomes. Okay, thank you for that. Now, Laura, um, um, in its report on North Ayrshire CPP, the Accounts Commission commented on the linkages between outcomes and spending by CPP partners, noting that, and I quote, together the main local partners in North Ayrshire spend over £500 million a year, but the CPP cannot yet demonstrate significant examples of sharing resources to achieve better outcomes or of directing resources towards agreed priorities. Uh, and the report recognised that, and I quote, the CPP has developed budgeting process to manage specific government funding initiatives between partners and its joint commissioning strategies between partner specific client groups, but that it does not apply this approach systematically for other CPP activities and initiatives. Yeah, I can maybe say a wee bit about the work that we've been doing to, to resource map. So we've um, completed the first, the first kind of phase of that. Um, and what we've done, we've sat down with our core partners, um, we've looked at our spend, and it ties in with the, the neighbourhood uh, planning approach, and uh, Iona can maybe say a wee bit more about that. But what we've done, we've looked at our spend, we've looked at our spend across uh, the neighbourhoods, uh, and where we've got to in that piece of work is we are looking to see the spend across the neighbourhoods, does that um, align with the need across the neighbourhoods. Now, what we've got just now, uh, the, 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 as I say, we've done the, the first kind of look at that, 
We've got a high level spend across each of our each of our neighbourhoods, but we've recognised that that information is too high level, and we need to drill down a bit further. So, for example, um, across the neighbourhoods, how much per head of older people population do we spend across the neighbourhoods, um, and how does that then fit with what we should be spending across the neighbourhoods in, in terms of need? And again, that, that links in with the, the significant work that's been done to, um, and it's, it, the, I think it's in the evidence of the areas of family resilience, um, where we've um, looked at each of the neighbourhoods, um, characterised the neighbourhoods and identified the needs across those neighbourhoods. So the next stage that we, or the next stage of the work that we need to do is to look at that spend, look at it acro uh, relative to need and take a view about where perhaps um, resources need to shift um, so that it better aligns spend to need. Um, I want to want to add, add further because uh, in your own submission, of course, you've talked about uh, the additional in, uh, information supporting the further development of resource mapping. Um, okay, in terms of, I mean, the neighbourhood approach has been really helpful to us in terms of looking at the resource mapping. Um, we know what that will show. That we show that, that in some rural areas, particularly areas like Arran, we probably spend disproportionate amounts of money in, in relation to the population. In North Ayrshire, like many other parts of Scotland, we have a huge variation in need uh, between Largs and the North Coast and Arran, where we have large elderly populations, people who live into their 80s or 90s, uh, basically, who need help health and social care services in their later years, uh, combined with um, Irvine and the Three Towns, where you see people dying 20 years earlier than the people in Largs and the North Coast, and Glasgow's got exactly the same challenges in a, in a far more compact geographical term, um, but who become sick in their early 40s and 50s and, and that's the challenge that we're facing at the moment so and I think that's reflected then in, in the work that Laura's talking about in terms of looking at needs so our strategic plan for health and social care has a, a needs strategy underneath it which has been developed by Ayrshire and Arran for us um, which looks at some of the issues that we have around emergency admissions and outcomes for vulnerable children because we've agreed those are kind of the, the priorities areas that we need to look at um, and we'll begin to look at how we address some of that uh, uh, neighbourhood issue in terms of what the strategic plan, which will be available for in its first draft within the next month, really. And that will set out how we're going to spend the £200 million that the Council and the Health Board have delegated into the partnership as well as how we'll spend the £2.9 million of integration fund that the government have made available. So we'll set that out and, we'll, we'll, and we're not going to be able to answer all the questions. In year one, we're going to probably have more questions than answers, but we will define which areas we'll prioritise in terms of mental health, in terms of older people, in terms of learning disability, in terms of children's services and indeed criminal justice services and what our redesign projects will be and how we will integrate the health and social care responses around those, those areas. And so we will make better use of the resources we've got but I would like to mention the elephant in the room in that demand for, health, for social care and for health services is increasing. And I think one of the things about prevention and early intervention is, uh, particularly um, for social work, is that we need the, the universal services to take up prevention and early intervention initiatives. And that's what we've been working on in North Ayrshire. What is it that health and education can do that begins to prevent some of uh, the traffic uh, towards social work? Because we've got more children in care than we've ever had before. We've got more children on the Child Protection Register than we've ever had before. We've got more elderly people in nursing homes than we've ever had before. And we've got, I, I'm now in charge of mental health services for the whole of Ayrshire and Arran. Um, and we have seen a huge uh, increase in the numbers of people who are acutely ill coming into hospital services who require one or two or three or four members of staff to deal with them. Um, so there are real strain in terms of the issues that we've got in provision of service and, and obviously in Ayrshire and Arm we're also amongst the highest in terms of uh, emergency admissions um, to hospital. So that's why we've prioritised emergency admissions to hospital. A lot of the money's tied up there. But it's not going to be easy to get it out and to move it into community. But obviously, that's something that we need to attempt to do. Um, but also to look at the outcomes for vulnerable children. And so we're, we're looking to see 
what we should do, that we're using the resource we've got in the best possible way, that we're integrating it across partnerships so that we are delivering with education and the police and the, so the health, and we, I mean health and social work, around children, and we're delivering uh, with the health and education and uh, social work and the voluntary sector, particularly around uh, older people and adults in the community. So. I think we can do a lot to, to look at what, how we can use the resource we've got better, but in the end of the day, the demand is still increasing. And we see every day the impact of um, the recession, and obviously, we, you know, which is why for North Ayrshire employment is, is the most important thing, because we know that having a job will have the biggest impact on somebody's health. Um, and for us, that's really important, but we see every day the impact of the recession, the fact that we've lost uh, more jobs than many other local authorities in North Ayrshire, and the impact of welfare reform, um, particularly of people being uh, put off their benefits and the impact that that has on very vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. So we have to cope with all of that as well as move the money. And I think you know that we are uh, trying to move the money that we can move but there's a bit for us it's a real challenge because we still have to admit people to hospital, we still have to take children into care, we still have to provide nursing care placements, we still have to provide care at home and we still have to look after people who have mental ill health. So th that's, that's the balancing game that we're playing at the moment. Okay, Jean. Thank you, uh, convener. I was just going to ask, given that the uh, CPPs are... Uh, relatively new, and that there was, you know, not everybody was wildly enthusiastic about them in the uh, er early days. If if people feel, and I, I think it was you, Lynn, who used the word trust, um, but it seems that that's really important. And if, in the process of of, given that it's a, it's slow, and that it's difficult to to achieve this. Does ever, do, do you feel that it's, it's worthwhile? And just, I, I think, listening to a fairly positive case, in spite, in spite of the, the huge difficulties there are. I mean, when, when these discussions take place, uh, are you talking about a different way? And I'm citing maybe Michael's point that there's a frustration with, with some kind of tick box, tick box systems. Or, or generally, do people trust each other to get over that or around that? Or do you, do you bend the system to make it fit? what you really want to do. That's not too complicated. Um, I think community planning um, is very important. Um, and I think and with us in Glasgow, the, recent, the sort of overhaul of the structure has really helped and having real political um, uh, support behind it and board level support at these other organisations. It's not just about the council, it's board level support at health level support, police, fire, etc. And I think that's there now. And I think it's there. Part of the the issue is the, the reduction in resources across the public sector, which is a result of the economic downturn. Um, means we just have to we just have to work together. And and I also think there's very much more of an appreciation it's about the citizens of the city. Um, and and that's just becoming more important. Because things are moving to outcomes, outputs and away from inputs. Um, that, that can change the mindset. So um, we are firm believers it has been slow. Um, I also think we have taken the approach that um, to look at these priorities, we think that's manageable. You know, to look at a whole budget of four billion and break it down, we felt in Glasgow was difficult to do and to what success. Um, and if we can show success quickly on the areas that we think we can do, that's also um, um, gives you confidence to go forward because you know you've achieved something. You're not just going around in circles, really. So that's how we see it. We see it as really important. And going forward, organisations, private, public sector, have to work together um, uh, to, to achieve what they want to do. Yeah, to echo what's already been said. I, I think the value of it is it has created that that trust. And I think the value of the outcome approach was everyone recognised when they saw the scale and nature that it was only by working collectively, collaboratively, that there would be some way of trying to resolve some of those issues. Um, because even in Murray, you know, for all of its relative affluence and, and what have you, there are still some profound issues uh, in terms of the way people's uh, lives are, are blighted by alcohol, to take an example. 
Um, so I, I, I think community planning has that value. It has created that trust. I, I can I give you one simple, simple example to illustrate it. What we've been doing in terms of our objectives is proofing them, uh, giving them a confidence rating, and all the partners have to give a confidence rating for each of the objectives. And one of the low-scoring objectives was uh, having confident young people, and that was all about attainment. And the reason why it was low is because, as is reported in the Scotsman this morning, we have real difficulty in recruiting and retaining teachers. Um, so there's an issue there that however well we might aspire to that target and that objective, we're not going to do it if we can recruit and retain teachers. But what that did, that then sparked off a very constructive discussion between Skills Development Scotland and HI and others around how could we work towards finding a solution to that. Now that type of discussion wouldn't have taken place before. Uh, it's a very simple example, I know it's highly anecdotal, but I think it illustrates the point for me in terms of the value of having the right people around the right table discussing the right issues. Jim. Uh, the Christie Commission uh, found considerable evidence of serious shortcomings in the capacity of public services presently organised to deliver better outcomes. Now, some years have obviously elapsed since the Christie uh, Commission uh, reported, and this committee took a lot of evidence uh, on that. I'm just wondering uh, what particular uh, bottlenecks uh, remain in terms of uh, delivering better outcomes at, at this time. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, I, I think it's, it's probably uh, an emerging consensus that some of the barriers that we face in terms of uh, joint working between public bodies in Scotland are around issues such as data sharing, for example. Um, th this is a, an area we've wrestled with in the youth employment mapping exercise we've been doing, and we've had uh, you know, some progress uh, in terms of finding ways of working around uh, this. Um, one of the uh, I mean, perfectly legitimate issues, I have to say, in terms of uh, data protection, etc., and, 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 and confidentiality. Um, but I think we have to find more ways of getting more uh, information in something resembling real time to share that information. If I could give the example which is in the paper around uh, we submitted around reoffending. for example we found that by uh, working uh, bringing a team together who can access uh, the respective databases of their respective agencies we can we can work around some of the data sharing issues but longer term and particularly around youth employment we've been having discussions with the DWP about how um, they can uh, better share the very crucial information they hold about uh, claimants and former claimants, um, some of that we think we can progress, some of it may require primary legislation. Um, so that's one of the biggest barriers. Another one which comes up uh, a lot is about, um, on the one hand, we are uh, work, trying to work, to go, work, work together um, collect more collectively in an integrated way uh, where we've agreed a joint priority. Um, but we are still, as partners, individually required to report um, on, on, uh, to um, Scottish Government, uh, different departments of Scottish Government. Um, and we've been having dialogue with colleagues in Scottish Government about that, about looking at how can we try and simplify some of the reporting uh, arrangements um, uh, in terms of if, if we've agreed to do work on uh, a preventive approach to alcohol together. Uh, uh, is there some way of ensuring that you know colleagues in health don't have to report separately and colleagues in the council don't have to report separately and colleagues in the police again on this exactly the same issue? Um, uh, flexibility in terms of um, uh, uh, obviously ring fence, removal of ring fencing has uh, 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 general removal of ring fencing has been extremely helpful, but you know I think the, the degree of flexibility, um, particularly around employment issues. Uh, will greatly assist and, um, for example, the progress we've made on the city deal, um, we would be interested in looking at equivalents in other areas of work where we could, um, yeah, as Lynn said earlier, and this is not a problem unique to Scotland, it's, it's obviously a problem in other jurisdictions, England specifically, um, where it may well be that a part, a partner A has to spend more in the short run to help make savings for partners B and C and how over time uh, it cannot be levelled out so that partner A uh, isn't taking the, 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 the financial hit um, because otherwise there is, there is a perverse disincentive for, uh, to, to resist uh, uh, change. I mean, the, the, I mean, colleagues will have other ones, but these are the, the, the barriers that I've certainly uh, we, we've been discussing in Glasgow and that have picked up in, 
in discussions with colleagues throughout Scotland. If any other uh, witnesses around the table have got issues with regard to, to, to bottlenecks and barriers, uh, Pamela? Probably very much similar to as you as you've described um, in terms of the the data sharing and you know that can be even simply within the the health and social care uh, arena and the time stealer that that actually is at a time when we're talking about capacity challenges and and trying to make that shift that a, a lot of energy and time can be stolen from uh, the lack of uh, a proper infrastructure to really allow that to happen easily and, and systems to happen easily. I think linked to the reporting uh, point, uh, we're probably talking more from a, a kind of health perspective, uh, the, is the competing demands. And it's a bit, as, as Iona was is laying out, but when you get into um, planned care, issues and waiting times and uh, the the initiatives um, and targets around that uh, then the resources can find themselves very concentrated and targeted away from uh, the prevention and indeed the community end of business to the acute hospital and and I think that's a real challenge because you may want to make that shift but it can be um, almost dwarfed by by the, the the need and the pressure to meet that a particular a target. I think, if I can just add, we're probably going back to the previous point um, in terms of you know, the value of, of community planning. I think it's critical and, and critical for the reasons of capacity. Um, that we certainly see uh, a proportion of the population who'd be far better served elsewhere than entering health and social care uh, services um, with the right resilience within a community and the right options available through some you know the, the, the support of the community there are probably better responses to to their uh, issues than than entering a GP surgery for instance I mean you, you say it's critical but in the report improving community planning in Scotland uh, carry it well at Scotland on behalf of the accounts commission the review concluded and I quote that uh, CPPs had not met the ambitious goals set for them and are seen as council-driven uh, exercises mm -hmm. and are unable to show that they not sorry, they're not able to show that they have had a significant impact on delivering improved outcomes across Scotland and that community planning had little influence over the use of public money. Yeah. I, and and I can understand why that statement to date you know, has been made and that observation has been made. However, I think there's something about the maturity and the, the journey that this particular mechanism is on. And I think um, when people talk about progress, and certainly I'm, I'm fairly new to Murray, but looking at how, mu how Murray's functioned and I've experienced a couple of the, the boards and the underpinning structures, um, it's certainly uh, not there yet, but uh, the, the trust and the, the cohesion is starting to be demonstrated. I think the, the so almost self-assessment and uh, confidence um, ratings that are being discussed across the partnership are uh, creating a, a better arena for perhaps more recognition of what, what's possible together. Um, and I suppose if you use alcohol, as, as which is one of our, our big issues, um, you know, that, that, that really is a, a, a cross-agency and a public problem, um, which can often be deferred to health. Uh, you know, so I, I think it's about the maturity and the journey that the, the partnerships are on and, and perhaps the expectation. OK, um, Laura, to be followed by John. Just wanted to emphasise the importance of information and information sharing because I think we've heard today about you know reducing resources and increasing demands and I think if there is a real um, and there is a real need to shift resources then having the information helps provide the evidence so that it, you can substantiate any any shift in resources so I think that's really important and I also think it's really important that the information is available from all agencies. Uh, Jim made reference to um, DWP expenditure and that has been there have been particular challenges in terms of getting local information around that and it is it is important in terms of seeing the whole picture uh, locally. Yeah, it was, it was the way Ms Gowans was talking just kind of was getting me thinking a bit. I mean, using words like maturity and we've used trust already and things, now these are quite hard things to measure. I mean, I suppose as an accountant originally, and maybe Audit Scotland are the same, you know, we'd like to see a certain amount of money going into this box and going down that route, which is nice and easy to measure. But I mean, I do accept that if you, if the Health Board and the Council and other partners are actually working together, even if you're still looking after your own pot of money, 
but because you're working together, it's been more effective. That's a good thing, but it's less hard to measure, or so it's harder to measure. I mean, is that is that where we're going, or is it a mixture of the two? Or I would hope it's a mixture of the two. To, to be honest, I think there, there will always be a, a tension and, a, and a, a, a point where it's hard to be so definitive because you could say um, that every opportunity as a practitioner in health or in social care where you interact with somebody that you would expect some sort of prevention activity to be to be evident, you, it would be very difficult to extrapolate that from that intervention. Um, however, we do know that we spend a lot of time with people where as I said before, a, a, a more a proactive approach maybe in the community could have an influence. And we've seen exp examples of that in em employability schemes and mental health in, in, in particular, um, that, that we perhaps can prevent that uh, that use of uh, medical and nursing models, if you like, which are very, can medicalise things that don't need to be medicalised. If we can understand the workloads and understand the, the spend around that, around that, I would like the challenge to still try and see if we can disinvest to to invest in more community activity um, and you know they, we've had experience of this with other structures like the alcohol and drug partnerships uh, previously DATS um, where the, I suppose the commitment of the partners and the willingness to you know the, the accountability not not completely there in a, an authoritative way but the the need if you really wanted to get a, a good outcome to work together was evident so so there's an element of maturity, there's an, er an element of commitment. I think in Murray, partly because of the size, we're very fortunate. That gives its own uh, dilemmas. But uh, one of the fortunate things is that there's a fairly small pool of people that have, uh, have got to work together if you, if you really want to make an impact. And, and we're kind of fortunate in that, that there's the, the, the layers are, are maybe less challenging. Although, albeit when you look at the Commission's report, that there, there are things there that we absolutely need to improve on. Okay. Well, it's not just about inputs as we discussed last well, week. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Outcomes we get for the yeah. all those inputs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's no one with any, uh, um, with any outstanding comments that they wish to make, so I'm going to actually wind up this session as we still have a lot of work to do on the committee this morning. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask each of our guests to, see, to um, give them an opportunity to make any final comments before we wind up. And uh, because Lynn started us off, I'd like to give you the final word. <laughs> So you, so you won't have to speak. So I'll let the others speak first, and you can come in at the end if you so wish. Uh, so who would like to go first? If, you don't have to, but if anyone's got any comments they want to make before we wind up, I own okay. Yep. I mean, I think in relation to the the discussion around maturity, I think it's a real issue. And I think, I mean, I've been in North Asia for four and a half years, and the difference in the partnership is tangible. And I think that is beginning to come through in terms of the outcomes, both in terms of safe and of working, and and, and in terms of healthy. Um, and you can see things like numbers of young people in, in police custody, numbers of young people in secure accommodation, all of that, numbers of young people in Pullman, for example, all of that reducing, and part of that's through partnership working. We're on the precipice now of the next step, and uh, I think that partnership and the way that we've worked in allowed the Council to feel confident about moving forward with its model for the uh, integration of health and social care, and the Council took that decision 18 months ago to basically put all of its social work resources into that partnership and the relationship with the health board at that point was so positive that they could do that. It wasn't like that four and a half years ago. So I think there's been a huge move forward and it is about feeling confident and feeling and trusting each other but um, obviously it's helped by legislation in this case. Um, so I think that 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 will be major step forward for us and I think that what Pamela's saying is right in terms of we will be able to do some of the intervention will be able to do much more earlier intervention than perhaps some of the preventative work but remembering that the partnership works across the whole of primary care as well as acute services so that the opportunities there are, are you know there are a lot of opportunities there to do things differently than we currently do them and to use the resources better and I think to think about the longer term care for Scotland citizens. So I'm thinking particularly maybe around elderly care, where a lot of the money, two thirds of the money is spent on emergency care. Um, and the, one of the challenges for us, for me and Pamela, <laughs> is to uh, help make some sense of that, to have a systematic look at that in terms of what that means across communities, um, as well as within hospital uh, services, which is where we tend to look at it, and to say, how can we begin to reduce some of that? And how could we transfer the resource to make it better for our communities and I think that's about 
how do we uh, across health, social work and the private and voluntary sector begin to look at what kind of care it is we want to provide in the future? And I don't think we've been in that position before. We've had lots of initiatives that uh, basically looking at joint futures and there's a zumpteen, umpteen of them basically. <coughs> but I don't think we've been at this position where we're, we're seriously saying, right, here's all the money that's on the table. Let's look at what it is that we think that the citizens of North Ayrshire in our case are going to need in the future. And that's where I think we are just now. Full of comments from our witnesses. <coughs> and also to say anything. Do you want to Oh, sorry, Roddy. Just to say, I, I think it, it was always going to be difficult in in a world of statutory bodies to work voluntarily, uh, and, and that's I'm slightly paraphrasing the controller of audit, and so I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that comment. And I, I think that's a fair reflection, and hopefully the the, the, the new uh, Community Engagement Act will will address some of those issues uh, in the fullness of time. But I, I think the cohesiveness, the, the maturity that's been referred to points yet again to the next logical step is, is prevention planning and all the benefits which I think we all hope for that have been so well articulated by North Ayrshire. Okay, thank you. Well, no one else wants to speak? Lynn, to finish us off. Um, I, I think that um, community planning and I think the health and social care that uh, that's just been referred to will, will take it another step. I think it will actually take a huge leap forward um, because it's such an important part but all the other agencies are involved as well. And there's a real price for us in it, making it work, is in that it's shown that public services um, are worthwhile, they're of value, um, and that we can do things, um, and we can do things right. And I think that's a prize for us in all of this. OK. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you very much to everyone around the table for your contributions. I'm now going to call a five-minute recess to enable a change of our witnesses and to give members a natural break.
Okay folks, we're all here, so I'm going to reconvene uh, the session. Um, a fourth item of business today is to take evidence from the Scottish Government Bill Team on the Community Impairment <coughs> Scotland Bill's Financial Memorandum. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting uh, Dr Amanda Fox, Heather Holmes and Ian Turner. So members have copies of the financial memorandum along with written evidence received in response to a call for evidence. So we will move straight to questions and as always I'll uh, start off with the questioning. Yes, sorry. Do you want to say a few words? Sorry, I just want to apologise for the sunglasses. I'm recovering from a migraine and my eyes are still exceptionally sensitive to light. So That's okay, I assume you did some me. kind of a, a, a photophobia, so I didn't <laughs> actually comment on that, don't worry. I didn't think you'd just flown in from a beach somewhere or anything. <laughs> if only. Oh, you're, you're running late and had to leave halfway through your sunbed treatment or whatever. But, uh, but thank you for time. the explanation in any case. <laughs> okay, right, where are we? Now, uh, Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, you'll probably know, has raised a number of concerns with the committee and uh, they sent a letter to all members on the 6th of October. Um, and um, what it, it mentioned was uh, the number of new burdens on local government. And they said, and I quote, well, individually, these are not overly onerous. They have the potential to combine to create a significant increase in work for uh, councils. And... Uh, Go on to say that the main concern from causal centres around the difficulty of anticipating the demand for this legislation and in turn quantifying the costs that will be incurred by local authorities. So I'm just wondering what work the bill team um, uh, went to in order to try and anticipate the demand for the legislation and uh, ensure that there's a, a kind of realistic um, uh, um, budget um, to go towards local authorities in order that they can actually deliver this bill effectively. There was a lot of work which was done during the consultation period leading up to the bill. There was an exploratory consultation and then there was a consultation on a draft bill. And at those times we were asking questions about actually how might the provisions be used and what the cost might be behind them. Now, at that time, very little financial information was actually provided or what cost information from others were actually provided. And we found difficulty in actually trying to amass what we had into terms of actually how you might use it. And so in actually looking at the demand was difficult from that perspective because we agree with COSLA that it's not going to be overly onerous and we also agree that the demand element is the, probably the element which could change the cost profile. However, it's going to be very... Is, because of the nature of the bill, because it's about community empowerment, in particularly in terms of participation requests, community right to buy and asset transfer requests, it's going to be up to the communities themselves to decide what they want to do. It's not going to be for authorities to decide what they want to do. And so the different aspects which they might do within that is going to be very hard to predict because communities are in different places, they're wanting different things, and it's going to be based on those local priorities. So trying to actually amalgamate that into a kind of demand profile is actually very difficult and, in fact, is actually hard to, to do, as we found out, and no one else has been able to do it in that respect either. <coughs> to part seven of the bill that relates to allotments um, as well as the wider consultation exercises uh, we also wrote out to the 32 local authorities in December 2013 specifically asking if they could provide us um, in with their views in relation to what the additional costs might be as a result of the new duties that are being brought forward specifically on allotments um, because as Ian rightly points out the cost will very much be dependent specifically in relation to allotments in relation to what provision is already there and what demand there is um, so we we specifically wrote to ask them about what the costs might be and the figures that are provided in the financial memorandum are based on the information that we received back from 15 of the 32 local um, authorities who responded to that to that request I understand uh, the, the kind of points you're making, and indeed, uh, you know, the minister uh, Derek Mackay actually uh, wrote to us actually just before COSLA did, uh, saying despite ongoing discussion of stakeholders have not been able to provide monetary estimates for costs or savings, making it difficult to provide accurate ranges. I mean, this all makes it quite difficult for the finance committee to try and uh, scrutinise this bill. I'm, I'm just wondering what safeguards are going to be in place. Um, should, for example, the the financial burdens on local authorities be significantly higher than is being anticipated? I mean, some of the things I've talked about is, for example, um, the bill is reliant on council support, provision of community capacity building assistance, which can be resource intensive, continues for an undefined period of time. 
Um, the, there's no reference in the financial memorandum and impact of reductions to local authorities' asset base, uh, and this could uh, affect um, the ability of local authorities to take out loans. Um, and then it talks about, uh, in terms of common good property, there'll be some additional costs for local authorities anticipated, but these are not quantified. And of course, you've already touched on allotments, which Cosl also mentioned. So I'm just wondering, you know, what kind of cushion will there be for local authorities if demand greatly exceeds um, the resources uh, set aside for this? From the point of view, in particular, of participation requests, which are new, and in terms of asset transfer requests as well, it's often the demand will be limited, and I use that word in a kind of broad sense, by the, the provisions of the bill itself, because it's not like, as Kosler tried to use the analogy of Freedom of Information Act, and it's not like that, because Freedom of Information Act is for individuals who can make requests for information, and that's what they do. The, the bill will be about community control bodies, as defined by the bill, so they must meet certain criteria, being in a written constitution, and then, then must bring forward a participation request or an asset transfer request, which must then meet this criteria within the bill as well. And then it goes into a kind of cost-benefit procedure where the authorities will look at the benefits of doing the process and then align that against actually what the cost might be as well. And that, as it goes through, will limit to a certain degree what the demand might be. And you're absolutely right about the capacity of communities, um, because communities aren't necessarily starting on the same level playing field. But well, that isn't in itself, we believe, a matter for the bill to do. The bill provides the legal framework to allow organised community bodies to do these things. Capacity comes from other funds and other places. For example, we've got the Strengthening Communities Fund, which is £3 million um, announced in April, which is to help community organisations in disadvantaged areas to increase their capacity. But it doesn't necessarily say that you then must do an asset transfer or you then must do a participation. It's for them to decide what they want to do on their terms. My concern is that you know if expectations are raised and even allowing for that three million pounds resources are not available to meet those expectations, I mean the bill will not be able to deliver as as promised, and that's why I was asking what kind of cushion might be available. Would the Scottish government be uh, willing to come back at a, um, a subsequent time to to, to look at perhaps? Um, you know, providing additional uh, uh, funding for l local authorities, for example, in order to ensure that the, the bill is delivered smoothly? I think, as, as with most new duties um, which go with legislation, the government has a general convention that will provide extra funding. The difficulty with this is we can't quantify that funding at the moment. So I think as it works in practice, we would need it to be demonstrated and quantified what that additional funding might be from the bill, and then that um, would go through the normal processes and be provided in that way. Okay, uh, just a couple of more questions and I'll open things out to uh, the myriad members of committee who are queuing up to ask questions. First one is with regard to community right to buy uh, and um, the Scottish uh, Property Federation stated that their main concern was, and I quote, that the enhanced scope of CRTB and by extension asset transfer may inhibit larger scale and complicated investment and development lands in a manner that has not hitherto been an issue under current rights. Do you, do you see that as being an issue, in, in fact? I don't. Issues like that were brought up around about the time that the Land Reform Scotland um, Act was passing through uh, the, the, par the Parliament. And since, since that, in the operation of the Community Right to Buy for the last 10 years, we haven't seen that and we haven't seen community applications coming in that are trying to blight these big developments. If we did get applications coming in that were blighty, if we want to use that word, the, the chances are they wouldn't meet the public interest test. So we also have check on our side we also have checks and balances that way. But I don't think that's I don't think that's going to be um, a big issue, um, especially on the urban land that will be coming within the scope of the community right to buy. Okay, and just uh, one final point um, before we move on is um, um, just I'll just give you three brief quotes here. One is from SEPA, who say that there are false expectations that SEPA will fully engage with all CPPs in Scotland, given that this would be highly resource intensive and not cost neutral. Highlands and Islands Enterprise have said, with regard to participation requests, they expect it to be able to absorb them to a large extent within the cost of staff time currently devoted to ongoing business improvement activities. 
and uh, NHS Lothian have said without appropriate support and investment in community empowerment, the key components of the bill will not be fairly accessible to communities. I mean, given these concerns, do you, do you not feel that there has perhaps been too much, uh, uh, you know, that the, uh, the Scottish Government have been perhaps a bit too cautious in terms of the amount of resources they feel that will be required under this bill? That's, I mean, it seems to be uh, from the evidence we're receiving that uh, that will be the case. I think in, in terms of SEPA and they're particularly talking about community planning because they'll be one of the partners in the 32 um, CPPs across Scotland. The bill doesn't say what their level of engagement in each of those CPPs should be. The fact they should be involved actually goes alongside what their own outcomes are intending to seek. How they engage will be flexible. It will be decided with them in collaboration with the other CPP partners. So we don't see necessarily the same resource issues I think that SEPA do themselves. Okay, but what about HIE and uh, NHS Lothian? On, oh, sorry. On, on HIE, I mean, we do, we do a bit of work with HIE um, in relation to the likes of the Land Fund and also cases where communities are wanting to use community right to buy, but also um, keep their options open for going through... Um, negotiated sales. The, HIE's work in, in relation to assisting communities is very much like our work in community right to buy branch. It's, there's a certain amount of flexibility with the, with the amount of cases that come in that, we ha that have to be dealt with and we have to build in a fair amount of flex, we build in flexibility into our work planning and manage it that way. HIE, as you said, they're, ex they're expecting um, more work and likewise Scottish Government for Community Right to Buy are also expecting a bit more work as well but the same with us is we, we reckon we'll have to be flexible in our in our ways of working. Uh, thank you. Um, Jamie to follow by Gavin. Thank you. <coughs> uh, convene on the, if I've taken anything from the experience of my political activity over the last uh, few months I think it's been a sense that I think people out there are, are wanting to have a greater say in the factors that determine their lives. So I think this bill is, is hugely uh, welcome if it can do anything to, to help achieve uh, uh, that. And um, I, I have to say, I, th I think I have some sympathy with what the, the bill team are, are saying here. I think if any bill is going to be presented as with a financial memorandum, would it be hard to say the exact uh, needs to cost it? It would be this one because, of course, if we're talking about empowering people, we don't really know how they're going to respond to that, so it must be difficult to, to quantify exact costs. And I, I was quite taken with a uh, turn of phrase that uh, Ian Turner you said, said uh, he talked about it being difficult to establish a demand profile, uh, I think you, you called it. Now, I wonder if what your perspective would be in relation to if you had done that and said, you know, this is, this is what demand will be, this is what it will cost us, could there have been a danger then that that could have been come viewed as a sort of upper limit and sort of saying you know that's that's the that's how much can be be done here that that might be viewed to be the opposite of empowerment yes i i think in trying to do a demand profile we would be having to guess what was we might anticipate as low demand or might anticipate as high demand and it's not actually that easy to work out what that might be with respect to uh, the number of the kind of rights we're giving communities to use in this for example on participation requests you might have an area which is not using participation requests at all and that might be because perhaps the public authorities in that area are actually very good at participation they're very good at engagement they're doing that job already and actually the demand is low in that area but you may also be demand is low in another area because actually the capacity of the community isn't there so how would you assess the two different communities going in because there could be different parts and different um, profiles which are available five council i think in their evidence to you talked about there will be peaks and troughs um as as things kind of work through the system and it's actually I think as public organizations change and that's the way I took HIE's comments about improving their business the fact actually they'll need to change in order to ensure that the bill works so that that when communities come to them it's not about engagement and consultation through their own mechanisms it's actually about what the communities themselves want to do the difficulties involved I suppose the point I was making more is if even if you'd attempted to do that and you come up with a set of figures, be it a low demand, high demand, a range in between. I mean, the, the danger in that is that 
people such as you, well, that's, that's, that's what we've got to work with here. And it can't really work that way if, if it's in the hands of people out there. They, it's, they, they, they sort of lead this, don't they? Yes, absolutely. The, the demand will be led by communities, so we can't, in that way, um, if we set a limit on it, it will confine it, it will box it in, in that way. Um, it is why community capacity is so important, actually, throughout the process. I think I'd also agree with what Ian's saying in relation to the experience of community right to buy. Um, at the time that the bill was going through the last time, they did try and work out what demand was, and that was going to be, I think it was 15 cases in the first year and five thereafter. It has worked out quite differently because we're getting an average of 15 cases a year, but we have to very much work flexibly with what it, with the communities that are out there and the demand because I don't when I when I'm working with my branch I don't always know what the next cases are going to be when when they when and when they come in but we utilize the resource very well we work flexibly but we don't set ourselves we want the legislation to be successful we want as many communities as possible to use it and it's for the communities to use and not for us to say to the communities to use it but we don't put a benchmark to say that oh we've only got 14 cases this year therefore it's not successful it's about the communities themselves leading and making it successful it's not so much a measure of success, it's not a case of we've got 15 cases this year, that's our upper limit, come back next year. It's, a, it's quite a good parallel, it's, it's, it's led at a community level, presumably. It, just turning to the, one last question, it can be returned to the, the COSLA uh, people, because uh, obviously there is a, a degree of criticism in terms of quantifying uh, costs, but I did note at the end they themselves essentially echo the point that uh, you've made, Mr Turner, that uh, essentially... It's very difficult. In fact, I'll quote exactly. It's difficult to anticipate the uptake and demand that we placed upon local authorities. This makes it very difficult to quantify the financial costs that we placed upon local government in complying with the legislation. Essentially, they're making this, the same point. You and I thought it was very interesting that, despite the criticism that seems to be in the cause of people, they've not made any attempt to say this is what it'll cost us. So they've not been able to provide figures themselves. Have they provided any with, to you? Um, not separately. The, the information we have is the information financial memorandum and the um, additional information that the Minister provided last week. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Gavin. Um, quite a lot of areas of public policy are demand-driven, and quite a lot of the bills that come before this committee are also demand-driven too. Uh, but what generally happens is that the uh, sponsoring committee or the sponsoring uh, bill team or minister do their very best to get a, an approximate amount and add to it caveats <coughs> of what they think might be upper or lower reality so that we've got a best estimate, um, sometimes with a number of caveats. So what, why is that possible for other demand-driven areas of policy, uh, but it's impossible here? I, th I think because the range would be too large to actually be um, considered worthwhile to some extent, um, because we don't know what that demand profile is going to be. Therefore, to put a range on it, if participation requests, for example, we've estimated could cost between 1,000 and 7,500 each, depending on what the request is and, you know, and what kind of area it covers. And now, to say there's going to be 100 means it's between 100,000 and 750,000 across Scotland. Now, it's, it's a range, but it, in itself, you could say, well, it could be 1,000, and therefore it expands out. But it only gets you so far on that. We can't really go into any more detail, actually, which is more reasonable at this stage. I think it's actually only going to be in practice, actually, that we see the sort of levels of demand um, that actually we can anticipate and actually see in practice. OK, so you, you, you've just got no idea how many requests. Are, there, there could be a million participation requests. I very much doubt there'll be a million participation okay. requests. Just the bill provides the kind of through who can do it in terms of community control bodies and actually what they can do in terms of the requests they can bring forward and then for the costs and benefits that is to go through the process will limit it to an extent and it, in doing the request for participation request for example they need to say what experience they have in it and what benefit in terms of outcomes actually this process will bring to it and it's for the public authority to assess it on that basis to go through that process and to see what it is then okay De definitely could be a million could could there be 10,000 participation requests i couldn't say at this time 
I doubt it. I, very, I think that would be at the very high end, and therefore, if you look at potential of risk, for example, I think that would be high impact, but it would be um, a very low likelihood. Okay. So, you, so what my point, though, is you seem to be able to quantify it slightly better here now than you've done in the memorandum. You, you, you must have some idea of what you think the likely range will be. We can't, unfortunately, because it is for the communities themselves, and it's because it's not just geographic communities, it's potentially communities of interest as well. So there could be different groups who want to do different things in different ways. And it will depend on the local circumstances in the local area, which means there's too many factors, there's too many variables to factor into what would be a reasonable um, demand profile in that way, a reasonable idea of actually how many could come forward. Okay. So we've gone back to what actually a unit cost might be, and to us, as I think as Kosler say, it's not overly onerous in terms of what they might be. Okay, so the, the government position is then it, it, it's impossible to quantify participation requests and costs. Same comments in relation to asset transfer <coughs> requests and costs? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, again, that will be limited by what we're talking about, but because asset transfer isn't just in the bill, isn't just about ownership, for example, it can be about leasing, it can be about managing, and it can be about using an asset. So there is a range of things that communities may want to do within the provisions of the Act. And as they currently exist already, so Community Ownership Support Service, I think, did 38 over a period of um, three years. So that provides an idea, but it's certainly not the range across Scotland um, because they're not involved in all of them and they only have limited funding to get involved in um, a certain number. So as we go forward, I think we will see actually what the bill actually does involve and will give us that. But we can't give you a definite figure of actually how much, how much it might be used. Okay. So the government says it's impossible to give figures on, on, on any of these aspects. How then, do, how then is the funding, given that your position is it's impossible, how is the funding mechanism going to work? It's impossible. Well, we can't do it at this time. If there was, for local authorities, if the new duties on the bill provide for, and they can demonstrate and quantify what those additional duties have cost them, then that would be part of the ongoing process in terms of um, local authority settlements. When, when, let's assume the bill is passed, which I'm sure it will be. When does it take effect? Is it financial year 15, 16? 15, 16 will probably be the year we start to implement. OK, all right. That's what I thought. So tomorrow, we are given the draft budget for financial year 15, 16. Every single uh, department, every single uh, NDP, be every single council and so on. We, we will have amounts allocated to councils tomorrow for the draft budget. So given that you're going to have to somehow quantify it tomorrow, how much has been given in terms of the draft budget to local authorities to cover the obligations under this bill? I think it comes within the current remit of local authorities, therefore I don't think anything particular additional has been done because we can't quantify or demonstrate what those additional burdens might be at this point. So, so in terms of your understanding for tomorrow, the local authorities will be given zero pounds and zero pence additional they already, from this bill. Asset transfers aren't new, so they already have a do community capacity work. They already do participation engagement with communities. So this, and the, which is one of the reasons why it's difficult to kind of extrapolate actually how much the bill um, may add um, in terms of cost to this process and asset transfers happen already across Scotland so we're not anticipating in particular in 2015-16 that there will be any particular um, financial burden and I think Cosler are right in the fact it's not going to be overly onerous and therefore could be um, encapsulated within their current resource however we do recognise that going forward there might be additional funding required. Well, my reading of Cosler was he said that the, in, the individual elements in themselves were not overly onerous, but the, the totality of it potentially was onerous. Is that not what uh, said? Yes, but I don't think we agree with the potentially it will become significant. I think we think the individual elements aren't overly onerous and as a totality themselves will not be particularly overly onerous and will be able to be used within their current resources with some addition if required because of um, the demand, if it is more than um, what local authorities can cope with, I suppose, would be the way of putting it in that way. Okay, so, so as, as it stands, as far as, you're, they're, they're, as far as you're aware, they're not getting any additional resources. Um, what if it turns out to be onerous? What if turn, uh, Cosler turn out to be right? There is a huge upsurge in demand. How concrete 
uh, is the guarantee from the Scottish Government to underwrite the costs that are then um, having to be faced by councils? I, I think it goes through the normal um, discussions with local authorities through the annual budgeting process. And they would have to demonstrate and quantify what was involved in that, and then that would go into discussions with the Scottish Government about what that might involve. Okay. I mean, now, I mean this may be a question I have to ask the Minister, I, and I don't know if he's giving evidence here, but, but uh, I can write to him. But if, let, let's just say, for example, uh, there is a huge upsurge in demand. It does cost councils, for example, for the sake of argument, several million pounds, uh, more than they had budgeted for. If they can demonstrate that this upcharge is a direct consequence of this bill, is it your understanding that the Scottish Government will pay <coughs> councils that money, or is that something that would have to be negotiated? I think that's something that would have to go through the normal processes of negotiation yeah. with local authorities. Okay. I don't okay. think there's a particular guarantees about it, but yeah. again, I think that yeah. would be probably more a question for the Minister than myself about it. Sure, sure. Okay, not grateful. Thank you. Uh, Michael, to be followed by Jean. Thank you, Convener. Look, you've established um, that the figures in the, the financial memorandum are unquantifiable, and you've explained why they're unquantifiable, and I accept your explanation, although it does leave me with some concerns about where, you know, as Gavin says, where does that leave us in terms of the, the overall budgets for local authorities? But can you give us an example of previous legislation where the financial memorandum was in a similar situation to this, where the, the potential costs are unquantifiable, and was there something established in that legislation which took account of the potential for the, the budgets to come under uh, pressure? I've looked and I haven't found a particular example. Okay, thanks. Jean. I was just going to ask, uh, um, I mean, there's a number of, of community groups and a growing number of community groups that are probably already w without the impairment bill, but looking uh, for example, to take over local authority assets for community purposes involving in, in the area that I cover, Highlands and Islands. And you mentioned uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Will Scottish Enterprise have a similar role? I mean, it's never had that community role that Highlands and Islands Enterprise has had. And if, if uh, this is successful, then I would imagine that, that they, they might have a role to play. Do you, do you see that? They potentially could have a role to play. It's Highland Islands Enterprise are often there as a funder, um, often provide um, the money to actually do some of these asset transfers. Um, I don't know if Scottish Enterprise would be in that position as it were. They will be involved in the community planning partnerships, and so they will be involved in setting the kind of local outcome improvement plans, which should hopefully set, uh, set in context um, how some of this might work within those local areas. Um, they gave evidence, I believe, to the local government committee last week, and they talked about being an opportunity-led organisation, and that's why they seek to go to where opportunities are and to kind of gain the maximum benefits from those. And it could be an asset transfer in, a, in, a, um, in, the, in the Highlands and Islands. Certainly they could be involved in that if they see a role for themselves. And, and just on, the, on trying to fix a budget, in a sense, I guess, when the land f fund... Community Land Fund was established. It was established with a bit of a, a thumb in the air, a finger in the air to judge. Nobody knew how many communities would apply or register interest in the land. Would that be right? Um, I mean, yes, as I understand I think, it. I think there was a sum allocated. Um, I don't know if there was any calculations done as to um, as to why that as to why as to how the figure was arrived at. The, the, there are a number of, of critics of the, of the bill at the moment that it doesn't actually go far enough, um, that it's, it's quite tame. In the consultation period, do you, what, what were the issues that, that you think that were more radical that we have been left out of the bill? Um, it's kind of hard for me to comment unnecessarily what was radical and what wasn't. I think certainly... Some people were looking for more because we set up a process within the bill to go through if someone has an asset transfer, that it is still the decision of the authority about whether the transfer takes place. Now, what the bill ensures is that um, process and that decision is transparent and open. 
Um, I think some community groups would want more of an, an absolute, um, we ask for it, we get it in that way. And I think it's the same on community right to buy, in particular on perhaps uh, abandoned or neglected land, uh, where they may see actually that opening up into beyond that abandoned or neglected land. But um, the bill doesn't provide for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, that concludes questions from the committee, but I've got one or two I want to ask further. It's just that, do you envisage that this um, bill will have a, a, an immediate impact in which there'll be a kind of um, um, rush to involvement, or do you think this is something where demand is going to steadily rise? Has there been any analysis of that? Depends who you speak to. We've, we've talked to a lot of community organisations and a lot of stakeholders. Some of them say there is a pent up demand in their area and they may use the provisions and there's always a may involved in it because it depends on what they want to do and how those um, communities might want to use it and other areas say that it will take time because necessarily the capacity of the community to adapt to it to use it and also because the way the bill constructs it's obviously in very legal language just because it's a bill um, so a participation request it looks quite um, a process if you go through the bill provisions, that will have to come out through guidance so that people can understand it and people can see it actually how it might be used. And actually, once people see them being used, then it may catch on in those terms. If they can see it having an impact in their local area, then it, the demand may increase actually from that. It will, will all depend on actually in what communities want to do and how they want to use it. OK, um, I just want to ask one further question, which is that the, the FM doesn't provide specific cost estimates for many parts of the bill, uh, and in some cases because costs are expected to be demand-driven. But Standing Order uh, Rule 9.3.2 states, and I quote, A bill shall on introduction be accompanied by a financial memorandum which shall set out the best estimates of the administrative compliance and other costs to which the provisions of the bill would give rise, best estimates of the timescales over which such costs would be expected to arise, and an indication of the margins of uncertainty in such estimates. I'm just wondering, you know, in, in what regard does the financial memorandum uh, meet that criteria for this bill? The financial memorandum did attempt in a number of places to put costs where we believed we could actually indicate what those costs were in terms of actually, particularly in terms of what the current cost is, so that you have an idea of actually it is fairly low in terms of actually what provision is made for it now and actually might, what might be made for in the future. We did also caveat a number of times throughout the bill about those margins of uncertainty in order to actually um, to attempt to do those wide margins would actually be unreasonable and actually potentially misleading in terms of actually what the bill might cost in future. And we did indicate a time scale. Standing orders make clear that it should be best estimates. I mean, the committee's been kind of down this road before, you know, when our bill team's come and they've not been able to tell us, you know, figures. It's quite frustrating from our point of view. I mean, we're supposed to be scrutinising legislation from a financial perspective and it's quite difficult when we're not really given much to get our teeth into, so to speak. You know, do you know what I mean? I know absolutely what you mean, the frustration is from our side as well, where it is difficult to quantify So these what costs. you're saying basically is it, was, it would be impossible to meet this criteria, or are you arguing that the criteria are actually met? I would argue the criteria are actually met, because it was accepted. Right, OK, thank you. Are there any further points you would like to make before we wind up the session? Not myself, no. OK, well, thank you very much for uh, your, you. your evidence and colleagues for the questions. I will now um, go into a private uh, session in order that we can complete uh, the work of the committee uh, in private, as was agreed earlier on. So I therefore like to um, have a couple of minutes recess to enable the public official report and witnesses to leave.